Now yesterday's House Rules Committee hearing on a juvenile crime bill. Yesterday, the panel met to decide the procedures for floor debate on pending legislation for a juvenile crime bill, which will be debated Wednesday. Among those members heard from include Judiciary Committee Chairman Henry Hyde. California Representative David Dreyer chairs the hearing. The Rules Committee will come to order. Uh, we have uh, yet to have the five members we were hoping to have uh, with us, but uh, very generously, Mr. Hall has agreed to let us proceed with uh, testimony. And uh, I have uh, an opening statement. I should say that we are closer to a quorum now that Ms. Slaughter is here. Thank you, sir. And, uh, and you know what? I was not going to let you proceed until Mrs. Slaughter arrived, even though Mr. Halver was very generous there. And she rushed in so that she'd have a chance to hear this. Uh, and we now have a quorum, uh, I am happy to say. Thank you, Mr. Linder. And I will proceed with uh, an opening statement, and then I will uh, call on uh, Mr. Hall or Mr. Moakley if he arrives. Mr. Conyers is here. We're happy to have the distinguished ranking member. So I will proceed with my statement, then we'll look forward to hearing from both the chairman and the ranking member. The committee meets today on a, uh, well, let me first say this is uh, for a consideration of H.R. 1501, the uh, Consequences for Juvenile Offenders Act of 1999. The committee meets today on uh, what is obviously a very difficult subject, youth violence and child safety, although Although overall crime and violence nationwide uh, have been reduced to 30-year lows and Americans of all ages are much safer than just a few years ago, a few high-profile tragedies in our nation's schools have struck a chord with all Americans. I believe that every member of the House wants to deal with this in a constructive manner. We have what is obviously a very difficult task before us. It goes without saying that, like America, the House is united in a strong desire to see an end to youth violence. Based on the approximately 175 amendments that have been filed, it's obvious that there are different proposals on the best way for us to proceed. Republicans and Democrats alike are on both sides of many of the more controversial proposals that are before us today. It's our intention to fashion a rule that provides for a full and focused debate However, although this demands that we, are, we carefully review and limit amendments to those that are relevant to the issues, there will be an opportunity for a wide variety of provisions to be voted on by the full House. No one can say what the final bill will look like in detail, but there are a number of important provisions that will be considered. First, H.R. 1501 provides $1.5 billion over three years for local communities to combat youth violence. Second, there will be proposals to set severe gun crime penalties for mandatory penalties for those bringing gun violence to schools to the death penalty for anyone convicted of killing someone at a school. Third, $50 million in funding uh, will be proposed so that all U.S. attorney's offices can assign one prosecutor full time to fighting federal gun crimes. And finally, a number of firearms restrictions and safety measures, including mandatory trigger locks, banning youth possession of so-called assault weapons, and background checks for gun shows will be considered. Before we begin, I'd like to offer a very brief observation about America's young people. While it's appropriate to search for answers in the wake of Columbine and Conyers and other tragedies, we must be careful not to lose perspective on today's school children. Our children are not reflected in the twisted rage of Columbine's killers, Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold, but rather in the diverse, energetic, and religious lives of the victims, such as Cassie Bernal, who died because of her religion. It is they who truly represent America's youth. Go to any school library, flip through the pages of any high school yearbook, and you will find the true measure of America's young adults. 
As we approach the new millennium, young people are more religious and do more volunteer work than earlier generations. Just a few weeks ago, I was proud to present local youth volunteer awards to high school students in Southern California who step up and volunteer in hospitals, police departments, at homeless shelters, a wide range of other organizations that are in need. They're out there giving back to their communities. So as we look forward, as we move forward on this bill, let's not forget that young people, their parents, and all Americans expect us to find appropriate, firm, and targeted measures that address youth violence and child safety. And with that, I uh, would like to see if my uh, colleague, uh, Mr. Goss from Sanibel, has any opening remarks. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I want to associate myself with your remarks. I think that's a fine comment about the youth of America. And uh, having just come from uh, my district, where we are celebrating and recognizing scholarship winners and graduations, uh, I very much uh, believe that is the proper spirit. I would like to ask unanimous consent to put my prepared. Without prepare. objection, it will appear in the record. It speaks to the matter of the Florida judge's problem, and I appreciate your allowing it in the record. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I missed the beginning of your remarks, and let me ask a question. Did you say there will be two separate pieces of legislation considered? Well, we, we uh, are going to be, uh, Mr. I called Mr. Uh, Now, when you say that, do you mean they're going to be brought up separately? Well, uh, we have, uh, that has yet to be determined. We are, in fact, uh, planning to move ahead with the hearing, and then we will uh, make that uh, decision. So is it possible that uh, they would be uh, voted on on different days on the floor well, of the I, House? Well, we're, we're hoping very much to get uh, this work completed tonight and for consideration of these measures on the floor on Wednesday. So that if there were two separate bills, they would both be considered on the floor on Wednesday? That's what we're hoping. Uh, what is the reasoning behind two separate pieces of legislation rather than uh, just one piece of legislation? Well, at, at this juncture, we are moving ahead and, uh, you know, a final decision has not been made as to exactly what the structure will be. That's the work of this committee. And uh, we want to consider both the, uh, the cultural issues as well as the gun issues. and we. Uh, think that bringing them on this two-track approach is the most responsible way for us to address it. If that were to occur, uh, do you know which one would be brought up first? Uh, that decision hasn't been made yet. And when members uh, testify today, uh, what guidance will we give those members as to which provision their amendments would attach to? Well, again, that decision hasn't been made yet, and they are welcome to testify on both uh, measures if they uh, so choose. Uh, is the assumption that their amendment uh, would be only attached to one of the, if the legis if two different pieces of legislation were brought to the floor, that uh, their uh, member's particular amendment would only attach to one of those two bills? Uh, I think that that's quite possible. But again, that has yet to be considered. Uh, we seem to have a fluid situation. Well, that's correct. I mean, that's, that's why we're here. And we will be working our will and making this determination as we move forward serving as the committee of original jurisdiction rather than the judiciary committee well this decision was made we have the chairman and the ranking member who were here for consideration of this and there's a desire to move ahead with this legislation and let me uh, well it'll be interesting uh, to hear and let me ask if i may because this is important in terms of uh, member schedules and you may have covered this at the beginning uh, how long do you anticipate the testimony will go today and at what point do you anticipate the Rules Committee will meet tomorrow to actually cast votes on this matter? Let me say that uh, it's our plan to begin as we did promptly at 2 o'clock, and we'll look forward to hearing from the Chairman and Ranking Minority Member of the Judiciary Committee, and we will proceed until 6 o'clock this evening, at which time we will consider the Air 21 legislation. We have a number of witnesses coming forward uh, to, um, to discuss that, and uh, then as soon as we complete that hearing, we will go back to consideration of this measure. And it's our hope that we'll be able to complete uh, the testimony on, um, on uh, these measures this evening. And uh, we have, uh, I guess we haven't set a time for tomorrow for the voting. Yeah, we, have, we haven't set uh, any time for tomorrow. We're hoping to get uh, this completed tonight. Do we have a particular target for how late we will go this evening? Just until we complete it. Further, uh, the, 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 target, the, tar the target is to uh, have us complete the uh, 
measure tonight. And then we would meet at, 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 meet at some point tomorrow. Uh, some well, it depends. I mean, if we get done, uh, you know, at a reasonable hour this evening, we'll look forward to consideration of the uh, of the measure here. I mean, that it's possible that we would vote on the rule this evening. Is I that think that's possible. Members should uh, stay close. Absolutely. Uh, I know that the uh, the ranking member may have a statement he wishes to make at this time. Uh, uh, I was just, uh, Mr. Oakley, I was just asking some procedural questions in terms of uh, how we will proceed to consideration. Uh, indications are that we may have two bills or that we may have one bill, and that this um, seems to be a fluid situation. As, as are most situations. Particularly this one. I'm happy to recognize Chairman, the uh, ranking minority member, Mr. Oakley. I apologize Moakley. for being 10 minutes late, Mr. Chairman, no, we're happy my, to have you. my plane just landed and they just don't give Nothing parachutes. Nothing of import. They don't give out parachutes to people yeah. in the until you, get to be 75, until you get to be 75 right. years old like President Bush. Um, nothing of substance has taken place. It's just my opening statement and some questions with uh, Mr. Frost. So you really didn't miss anything. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, we all know that a lot of people are watching this committee to see what we'll do about the growing problem of juvenile crime in the United States. Uh, if the way we're starting this process is any indication, we're in a little bit of trouble, I think. Despite what Republican Speaker Hastert originally promised, the bill did not go to the Judiciary Committee for a thorough examination. Instead, it bypassed the committee it was supposed to go to and landed right in the lap of this Rules Committee. The Rules Committee asked members to submit amendments drafted to H.R. 1501 by noon on Friday, but when we got to the floor schedule, we saw that uh, 1501 had been replaced by an another bill, a non-numbered bill, and we still don't know what will take its place, and I'm waiting to hear from my dear friend and the chairman of the committee. Uh, to see. Just Love to. HR, HR fifteen oh one still is the bill that was a clerical mistake that was made in that blank. HR fifteen oh one is still the bill. Sorry. So a new bill is not going to be substituted for fifteen oh one. Okay, well that's fine. Okay. Uh, The process through which this bill has been considered is probably one of the biggest legislative messes I've ever seen. I think that an issue as important as this means deserves much better. It certainly deserves to have been considered by the committee to which it's been referred, as was promised by the speaker. But it wasn't in two weeks this bill hasn't spent languishing, have enabled the NRA to get its ducks in a row and diminish the chances will pass the Senate Youth Violence Bill, which would have been an excellent start at slowing down the scourge and the violence in our schools. But as I understand it, uh, that's just what the NRA wanted. Uh, as you probably hear, the top NRA official quoted in the news said, 90% of the measure is our stuff, whatever that stuff means. Unfortunately, Mr. Chairman, I, I, I believe he's probably right. The NRA not only weakened the gun safety bill that passed the Senate, but they also took one step further and weakened safety laws that have been on the books for years. In other words, Mr. Chairman, rather than moving this country forward towards safer schools, I believe the NRA and some of its friends are actually taking us backwards. Uh, they decided we didn't really need a con to conduct a background check on everyone who buys firearms at gun shows. They've decided we didn't really need to child safety locks. They decided the Brady Bill needed to be weakened just a little bit. And they decided guns used in crimes didn't really need to be traced to the sellers. Mr. Chairman, everybody is sick and tired of hearing about kids in schools getting killed, and I'm sure no matter what legislation we passed, it wouldn't get rid of it completely. But I think parents should not have to worry about anything more than how their child does in algebra when they put them on the school bus in the morning. And I realize that gun safety measures and back background checks are, are a part of a larger solution, but I think they're a pretty good start. So, Mr. Chairman, the parents of the children who were killed in Littleton, Colorado, have asked us not to let their children deaths be in vain, and I think we should honor their request. 
Many members of Congress have submitted amendments to this bill. We will be hearing a lot of very good ideas from Republicans and Democrats alike, and I hope my colleagues on this committee will consider carefully each and every one of them, regardless of what the NRA says. The safety of our schoolyards depends upon it. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Moakley. Mr. Linder? Just one, one comment, Mr. Chairman, and that is that I do hope that during the consideration of this, we keep in perspective the fact that other factors have caused problems for our young people, too. I'm told that seven of the eight kids we shot in schools were on either Ritalin or Prozac. Um, we should be looking at all those areas, but 99.9% .9 of those kids are good kids. And in most of the school shootings, the guns were stolen or broken into a case to get... Uh, let's, let's just keep it in perspective. Mr. Chairman, I, I don't have a written statement. I would just say that we've got a very good chance to pass a piece of legislation that could be very well the most important piece of legislation we passed this year. And uh, there's a lot of things that have the potential of being in this bill, parental responsibility and gun measures, uh, um, certainly, hopefully, the teaching of character education in our public schools and um, a lot of different types of things. I hope we don't miss the opportunity and the chance to, to really pass a meaningful piece of legislation. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, be with you today. I, I would uh, like to respond that I believe that what we're doing here today should is very serious and should be taken that way. Uh, every member of Congress uh, is concerned about our ability to put our children or our grandchildren or those that are in our families uh, on a bus or to deliver them to school knowing they will come back safely at the end of the day. And it is of paramount importance that we understand that, uh, that that's what we're after when we talk about school safety. I am concerned and distressed uh, from what I have seen uh, thus far uh, with people who blame one group or another, uh, put the blame and shift that to an organization rather than us looking at how we're going to solve the problem. I believe that the problem will be solved when we let local people, local schools, local law enforcement come into contact with people who they believe and who they know best are problems in certain areas. Years ago, we had problems with skyjackings. Law enforcement caught up with that problem. Then we had carjacking problems. Local law enforcement caught up with that problem. Today, what we are dealing with is a series of what I would say a broad-ranging uh, sweeping uh, assault on the Constitution of the United States. And uh, not everybody agrees uh, that this is the right way to go. I believe that if we take also the words, and I know my colleague, Mr. Moakley, talked about what we're doing here today. The parents said, don't let this happen in vain for what happened to our children. There are also parents that said, don't blame an organization don't blame one person or another. We as a, uh, uh, a country need to come to grips with what we are dealing with. And so I have confidence that we will be able to today uh, and in the, the coming days to craft legislation, to craft an answer that aims at the problem. But I would like for us to be very respectful that this old document that is 211 years old called the Constitution, that there was a great bit of wisdom that was put in that document. Uh, and I would like for us to, as we decide to either scrap it or trample on it, for us to understand that there are people on both sides of this issue who should bring thoughtful, uh, careful consideration to that which we're doing. I am devoted and dedicated as, the, as not only the congressman from the 5th District of Texas, but also as the parent of two small boys that go to school every day. I, too, am concerned uh, about the safety of our children and will try and weigh and balance that with the constitutional duties that we have here in Congress. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, this morning before I left my district, I visited two schools. Uh, one group of ninth graders in Fairport, New York, who was so traumatized by what had happened in numbers of schools, not just Columbine, but all the others as well, that they all got together with all the different groups in the school and decided that they were going to go for unity in this school and that they were going to stop breaking up in little groups and little cliques and they wanted to pay attention to the children among them who felt left out. That was such a mature and wonderful thing to do. I wish we could do as well. Uh, and I'd like to just say for the record, because I think this is important that this information be dispensed. There was a study done in a preschool of kids three to five years old where the parents had at first been um, interviewed, that about 150 parents, half of them said they had no gun at home. Half of them said they did have a gun, but they were absolutely certain that their child knew nothing about it or hadn't the foggiest idea where that gun was kept. And then they did an experiment with the children where a policeman came in with an empty gun and he said to them, this is an empty gun. And I want you to promise me that if you ever see one of these, that you'll run as fast as you can and find the nearest responsible adult and tell them about it. And they all nodded their little heads up and, oh, yes, you bet. That's exactly what we're going to do. The policeman lays the gun down on a table, empty gun, walks out of the room, and they observe these children through a two-way mirror. Every single child fought each other to get over to get their hands on that gun, pointing it at each other, trying to make bullets out of crayons. Heaven help anybody who tries to stand between Congress of the United States passing gun lock legislation and the American people. They've had enough of it. I'm telling you that there, it is the most, it, it defies belief to me that something as simple as making certain that a minor child, a small child, getting their hands on the gun because of the hundred, uh, part of the parents that said they had a gun at home, every child said they not only knew where it was, but they played with it. And in fact, some of the parents who said they had no guns at home were thrown in by their children who said, oh yeah, daddy's got one in his drawer. We're living in sort of a fool's paradise here if we think that somehow by education we're going to say to these children not to do it. And it is not, uh, the thing that has stunned me is that these are children from intact homes in almost every case. Uh, these are children who had easy access to guns. Some may have broken into cabinets, but for some of them they just went and got them. Some of them got them from their friends, others bought them at gun shows. We are really lagging behind the rest of this country if we think that parents and teachers and decent citizens are not crying out for some help here. They are not going to understand it at all. If we fail in the responsibility here to really pass some legislation, what in the world, when a nine-year-old goes to his father and says to him, where can I get a bulletproof vest? then we've got children afraid to sleep at night. And I know they're afraid to go to school. And that's a terrible way for children to have to grow up in that kind of fear. We've done everything we could to protect kids here. We make sure that they're vaccinated, that they're educated, that we do everything else, but we won't do anything to keep them from being shot to death. Then we really are failing in our responsibility. And I certainly hope that the Rules Committee make it possible for the kind of legislation to come to the floor to make a real difference that we can at least do as well as the Senate and frankly I'd like to see us do a little better. Thank you Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much Ms. Slaughter and I uh, thank my colleagues for their remarks and uh, I'd like to say that uh, that is the reason that we are sitting here today so that we can address these very pressing concerns that are there about child safety and uh, with that I am happy to call on my uh, dear friend, the Chairman of the Judiciary Committee, Mr. Hyde. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and distinguished ladies and gentlemen of the Rules Committee. If I may preface my remarks by uh, a personal comment, I regret and deplore the politicization of this issue, and this is going to be drenched with politics, I gather, and I'm so sorry to see that happen. The subject deserves better. For example, my dear friend, and my, he is my dear friend, Mr. Moakley talked about weakening the gun lock, the trigger lock device. <laughs> we have strengthened it. If people would read the bill, not listen to this partisan sound bites, they'd understand we have strengthened it. 
We have borrowed language from Senator Cole's bill, S-716, and Representative McCarthy's bill, that's H.R. 1342, to add two additional ways to secure a lock, to disable uh, a, a gun from firing. We have strengthened it, not weakened it. And I have a letter that I wrote to Congresswoman DeLauro, who was singing this song on the floor that we have weakened it, and explained to her in some detail how we've strengthened it. And I would ask this be made a part of the record. And I, I would direct it to my dear friend with Carl Yastrzemski's ring there, uh, uh, Joe Mokley. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, and my dear friend John Conyers, the ranking member of the Judiciary Committee, uh, we do appreciate this opportunity. I've submitted a number of amendments dealing with the culture of violence, access to guns, juvenile justice, and punishment for crimes. Time, happily, will prevent me from detailing every provision, but if I may focus on a some key provisions. First, I'd like to address access to guns, particularly mandatory background checks at gun shows. There's been a great deal of discussion in the Senate and the House about how to deal with gun shows. There are approximately 4,400 gun shows per year where background checks are not performed on gun purchasers. Many believe this is a loophole that must be closed. Some believe this is a non-issue. Others believe gun shows should be completely shut down, and they have used the mandatory background check as a disguise for closing down these shows. I think that's wrong. If you want to close down gun shows, propose it. If you want mandatory background checks, propose that with honest definitions and realistic regulations. My proposal on gun shows is straightforward. It achieves everything that's necessary to ensure mandatory background checks are performed by responsible people at gun shows and does so without pushing them out of business or interfering with private or family transactions. This provision closes all of the loopholes which currently allow dangerous criminals to acquire firearms at gun shows. It also requires gun show organizers, licensed dealers, and instant check registrants. Those are individuals authorized to conduct instant background checks at shows to keep records that can be used by federal law enforcement officials in criminal investigations. Criticisms of this bill by the administration suggesting it doesn't close all gun show loopholes are entirely unfounded. There are primarily three erroneous arguments made by opponents of our legislation. The first concerns the definition of a gun show. Our legislation would define a gun show as every event at which 50 or more guns are offered for sale and there are not less than 10 vendors. The administration opposes the 10 vendor requirement, arguing that gun transactions at smaller gatherings would not be subject to background checks. I think it's important to distinguish between private firearms transactions, between family and friends, and an honest-to-God gun show where criminals can acquire firearms in anonymity. If we eliminate the requirement for a minimum number of vendors, we blur the critical distinction, which I'm sure some would like to do. Further, the Lautenberg Amendment on gun shows contains a finding that there were 4,400 gun shows in America last year. I wonder if any of these gun shows had less than 10 vendors. I seriously doubt it. The second issue involves the definition of a gun show vendor. The administration opposes our requirement that a vendor be someone who sells firearms at a gun show from a fixed location. This fixed location is necessary because gun show organizers are subject to federal criminal prosecution if they don't register every vendor selling firearms at their gun shows. These organizers cannot know if somebody who is merely attending a gun show spontaneously offers to sell a firearm to another person. 
it would be manifestly unfair to hold organizers criminally liable for something they can't control. It will only serve to discourage, discourage organizers from conducting gun shows, which may be the hidden intention of the administration, but please come out and say so. It must be noted that every firearm transaction at a gun show, regardless if the seller is a licensed dealer, a vendor, or merely in attendance, requires a background check before transferring the firearm. The definition of a gun show vendor has no effect on this requirement. The third issue concerns the period of time a seller must wait before transferring a firearm if he hasn't received a final response from the instant check system. Our legislation provides for a waiting period of three days from the time that the instant check is initiated. The administration wants three business days. This small amount of additional time we feel is unnecessary. The vast majority of instant checks are resolved either instantly or within a few hours. For the small number of cases which take longer to resolve, federal or state officials doing background checks can handle them quickly at the start of the week. We must remember gun shows only last one or two days, typically on weekends. By starting the clock on the weekend, there's a much better chance that law-abiding citizens will enjoy their right to acquire a firearm before the show is concluded. I will offer an amendment to prohibit the importation of large capacity ammunition feeding devices in the United States. Existing law, 18 U.S.C. 922 W, prohibits the transfer of, quote, large capacity ammunition feeding devices, quote, an exception is provided for the possession or transfer of any such device lawfully possessed on or before the date of the enactment of the Violent Crime Control and Law Enforcement Act of 94. The term large capacity ammunition feeding device is defined in existing law as a magazine, belt, drum, feed, strip, or similar device manufactured after September 13, 1994, and has a capacity of or can be readily restored or converted to accept more than 10 rounds of ammunition. Since existing law excludes from the definition any device manufactured on or before September 13, 1994, such devices have been approved for importation into the U.S. if the importer submits evidence establishing that these devices were manufactured before September 1994. My proposal would amend the definition of large capacity ammunition feeding device to delete the language limiting the definition to devices manufactured after September 1994. Thus, all devices with a capacity of more than 10 rounds of ammunition would be subject to the restriction of the law. However, the proposal would retain the existing grandfather exception in the law for devices lawfully possessed on or before the date of enactment. In addition, this section would add a provision making it unlawful for any person to import a large capacity ammunition feeding device. And I can assure you the NRA did not write this provision. The effect of the amendments would be to bar the importation of all feeding devices with a capacity of more than 10 rounds of ammunition, regardless of the date of manufacture. Such devices that were lawfully possessed on or before September 94 would be covered under the grandfather provision and continue to be possessed and transferred without restriction. <clears throat> Given the vast worldwide supply of magazines, with a capacity of more than 10 rounds, the amendment is necessary to limit the commercial sale of these devices. My amendment is consistent with the congressional intent to limit the general public's access to magazines with a capacity of more than 10 rounds. I will also offer an amendment that will prohibit any person younger than 21 from purchasing or attempting to purchase a handgun, semi-automatic assault weapon, ammunition for such weapons, or a large capacity ammunition feeding device. 
It's a straightforward attempt to prevent young people from purchasing two classes of very dangerous firearms. Current law already prohibits the transfer to and possession by a juvenile defined as younger than 18 of handguns and handgun ammunition. The amendment's an incremental change to existing law designed to prevent young people, many of whom are still immature, from purchasing such dangerous weapons. Thus far, I've discussed the legislation concerning juvenile justice and gun control. I think it's crucial that Congress address some of the cultural issues that are influencing the behavior of America's youth. The fact is new gun laws and tighter control of the juvenile justice system are not by themselves a cure for the epidemic of youth violence. In order to be truly responsive to the issue of youth violence, Congress must identify and address the influences that cause young people to become violent. What happened in Colorado, what happened in Georgia are not going to be remedied by passing new gun laws. 17 federal laws were violated by these two young killers in Colorado and seven state laws. And so to remedy that, pass a couple of more gun laws. Uh, I'm not against doing it. We should always look at our gun laws and tighten them up if they need to be tightened to keep dangerous weapons out of the hands of minors and, and criminals. But there's more to this than simply passing new gun laws. There is a spiritual void in the heart and soul of too many of our young people filled with a culture of death, a culture of violence, and it's something that we ought to take this opportunity to look at. And part of the problem is our children have been overexposed to violence, and this, coupled with that spiritual vacuum, leaves children desensitized to violence and unable to appreciate fully the consequences of their sometimes brutal actions. As popular entertainment becomes more violent, sexually explicit, and as it depicts more and more disrespect for life and for the rights and well-being of others, some of our children are starting to believe this behavior is acceptable and normal. They don't understand or care that acts of violence have tragic consequences. Consequently, I'm asking you to make in order a package of proposals that will help address this cultural breakdown. We don't have the answers. We're groping. We're searching for the answers. But we can't say that we should stand by paralyzed in, in the face of these tragedies. The first section of my cultural amendment is a provision creating a new federal law to protect minors from explicit sexual and explicit violent material. The First Amendment is not absolute and does not protect obscenity. Currently, many states do this through harmful to minors statutes that prohibit the sale of sexually obscene material to minors that is not necessarily considered obscene for adults. However, most of these state laws don't cover violent material. Today, there are no federal laws that prohibit the sale of material that is considered obscene for minors, but not for adults. My amendment would change that by creating a federal law that would prohibit the sale of obscenely sexual and obscenely violent material to minors under the age of 17. This new obscenity for minors statute does not restrict the rights of adults or parents to view certain sexual or violent material, nor does it prohibit anyone from producing such items. Rather, it empowers parents to make decisions about what type of material is appropriate for their children. With enactment of this legislation, parents will decide whether their kids can see explicit sexual or violent material. I've included as the second section of my amendment a provision whereby Congress asks by a sense of Congress resolution. That's all this does. This doesn't mandate anything. It expresses the sense of Congress that retail establishments that sell music allow parents to review in their store a copy of the lyrics accompanying the sound recordings they offer for sale. This is a simple way for parents to read the lyrics accompanying the CDs they're considering buying for their children. It's my hope that retailers can take this responsible step on their own, 
We aren't asking them to give away copies of lyrics. We're asking them to give the parents a right to look at them so they can determine for themselves whether these lyrics are appropriate for their own children. The third section requires the National Institutes of Health to conduct a study of the effects of violent video games and music on child development and youth violence. Numerous studies have been conducted regarding the impact of violence in television and movies on children. There have been very few studies, I'm aware of none, on the impact of music and video games on young people. The fourth section of this amendment is very similar to the Senate amendment providing a limited antitrust exemption to the entertainment industry to enable that industry to work collectively to develop and implement voluntary programming guidelines that alleviate the negative impact of TV programming, movies, internet content, and music lyrics on the development of children. The fifth section of the amendment promoting grassroots solutions to youth violence authorizes the Attorney General to award $5 million annually for five years to the National Center for Neighborhood Enterprise for the purpose of funding direct demonstration operations and program development grants to community organizations in nine cities. In awarding grants, the National Center will consider the track record of grassroots entities in youth group mediation, crime prevention, the engagement of the grassroots entity with other local organizations, and the ability to enter into partnerships with housing and law enforcement authorities. The National Center has been identified for this demonstration program because it has a proven track record in using limited funds to turn around gang and violence-infested inner-city housing projects, as evidenced by their transformation of the Benning Terrace housing project right here in Washington. The National Center puts kids on the right track by directing them towards faith, hope, and opportunity and asking them to take responsibility for their communities and for themselves. And John Conyers knows even better than I the success of this group. He's been out and visited Benning Terrace and has seen the transformation from a very dangerous area to a very useful, functional area. I know we don't have the answers to the this problem, but uh, our approaches are, are modest. However, study after study has shown that exposure to violence adversely affects the development of children and leaves them to dispo disposed to act violently. Even the most caring parents can't prevent these influences from reaching their kids. We can help parents, and I believe my amendment is a step in that direction. I urge you to make my amendment in order and request that we be given appropriate time, in your good judgment, to equally divided, to debate uh, this amendment. It's controversial, I know that. I know we're bucking against big money. Uh, the entertainment industry is powerful, but it, I refuse to believe that we're impotent in the face of this terrible onslaught against our kids, this cultural pollution. To, to not do anything. So uh, these are my ideas, and I'm sure open to any better ones that come along. I thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. you very much, uh, Mr. Hyde. We appreciate all the time and effort you've put into uh, this very important issue. Happy now to recognize the distinguished ranking member, friend Mr. Conyers. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman uh, and ranking member Moakley. And all of the members of the Rules Committee, I'm, I'm here today because not of the power of the entertainment I industry, but the power of the National Rifle Association organization, which has spent, as you can read in the papers, uh, over a million dollars over the last two weeks, not only to uh, delay this measure coming to the People's Congress, but to actually participate in the drafting of new legislation. So it's a little late for us to come here to talk about, we hope that this measure will not be politicized. Ladies and gentlemen, it already has been. And I have never uh, 
in the wake of the uh, shooting tragedies in Colorado and Georgia and elsewhere have, have never argued anything but the fact that there is no more urgent order of business for the American people than this issue of juvenile justice. But unfortunately, we have a procedural breakdown that uh, cannot be evaded here. Uh, uh, we're, we're being forced to consider this issue in the most unprecedented way that I have ever experienced in my career in the House of Representatives. When we met with the speaker uh, before Memorial Day recess, we were told, and uh, Chairman Hyde and uh, Leader Gephardt and uh, Mezu's army and DeLay were all there. We were told that even though we wanted to take up the gun violence provisions already sent by the United States Senate, that we couldn't because we, we wanted to study carefully all of the measures that were to be examined and that therefore that was a, an impossible request and was denied. We could not take up the Senate bill on gun violence because we needed regular order and committee hearings and a committee markup. That promise has been broken. And when the Republican leadership decided, in my judgment, that it was avoiding debate on gun violence as in many ways as it could, we now have come to this sorry procedural scene that we are here today to, to try to correct. The Republican leadership told us that they supported in principle, originally, the Senate passed gun violence amendments, only to begin to back off of them subsequently, only to unveil two weeks later what I regard as a very weak provision which would apply only to a fraction of the gun show transactions. Then we were told that H.R. 1501, the Juvenile Justice Bill, would be the base text against which every amendment should be written. Now, every one of the 175 amendments that you have before you were writ written on that assumption. Uh, it was at 1240 this afternoon that we were told that there would be an additional bill brought forward. That, that's uh, roughly an hour or so ago, uh, or two hours ago. Uh, what we're doing now, uh, and it didn't even have a number, it was H.R. blank, which was really the base text, uh, leaving us without any instruction as to how to write amendments to the second bill. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, do you realize what you've done? We're, we're now having a determination on what amendments to be considered on a bill that was brought to the ranking member's attention this afternoon. We've had no hearings in the committee on these measures. Contrary to the, to the, uh, the agreement that we thought we, that if we were going to move with this rapidity, we could have taken the, the parts of the Senate bill and the bill that the committee has already agreed to ju juvenile justice and bring them together. So the, the disarray that we are in uh, confounds the imagination. I, I don't know how the members are going to uh, draft amendments to 2122. I don't have any here today. Uh, I just found out about this new change. Uh, we thought out about this new change. Uh, we thought we were proceeding uh, in a way that I didn't appreciate because we hadn't had hearings on any of the gun amendments. And so now we have two bills 
uh, that we are now moving at the same time, uh, which, which if anyone can explain to me how we're going to do that within a rules committee that is putting this together right now, I will, will stay here to find out about. The disorganization, the lack of process uh, is being made up as we go along. And I decline to support it until we can put an end to this gamesmanship. Are the rules being changed perhaps because the dem of the democratic substitute the bipartisan Senate passed gun violence amendments, the bipartisan juvenile justice bills from the judiciary and the education and workforce committees and the COPS program reauthorization, uh, which has appeal on both sides of the aisle and stands a chance of passing. Is that the reason for the rules changes at this 11th hour? Well, I think this is a, a process which I cannot agree to, and as you can see, uh, I, I will not support. We have fitted, flitted away the opportunity for bipartisan legislation. We were willing to work with Chairman Hyde to satisfy his concerns about gun show language, and instead, we have opted for a kamikaze legislative process. We shouldn't do this. Never in my tenure in the House of Representatives have I witnessed this confused or chaotic procedure on an issue so important to so many of our citizens. In short, what we have seen is a process designed to avoid debate, avoid accountability, in which maximize confusion and the opportunity of special interest groups who are now impacting cavalierly on the process. This type of backroom and secret process is precisely what makes the cynicism of our government uh, manifest by so many of our citizens. By rights, Mr. Chairman, you should not have been placed in the position that you are in today. Unfortunately, due to a series of miscalculations and misstatements by the congressional leadership, the congressional Republican leadership, you are now forced to substitute your judgment for that of the entire House Judiciary Committee and to make decisions on the fly and behind closed doors as your committee will meet, that will affect the lives of millions and millions of children and adults in this country. Now, it's my belief that the American people want responsibility and action on this <coughs> matter and not more loopholes or broken promises. The fact that this issue is controversial, we cannot help. But this cannot serve as an excuse for avoiding the legitimate discussion and debate and votes on these amendments. The Senate spent two weeks on this subject, two weeks debating the measure, and there uh, can be no reason for us not to craft a rule in the wee hours of the evening or night which cuts off debate and amendments on an issue that will affect so many of our children's lives. In terms of substance, there are a number of fatal flaws and poison pills included in the terms of the most recent proposals introduced by the chairman of the Judiciary Committee. First and foremost, despite the promises by the Republican leadership to accept and enhance the Senate passed gun safety provisions, the Hyde McCollum bill proposes more of the same old NRA, National Rifle Association loopholes that have already been voted down in the Senate. In some cases, the Hyde-McCollum bill will even open up new loopholes 
that do not exist under current law. We would be happy to provide the committee with a side-by-side -side which shows why the committee's proposals are not valid. Chairman Hyde has proposed, and, and I give you an example, uh, that the, the bill would apply only, uh, apply the definition at events where 10 or more vendors are selling guns, regardless of the amount of the guns sold. This means that nine vendors could sell thousands upon thousands of firearms at a gun show without being required to do any criminal background or age checks. And th these aren't family transactions at these shows. These are strangers that have never met before. <clears throat> and in addition, uh, H.R. 2037 allows vendors to complete transactions of gun sales with no background or age checks if the seller and purchaser merely step outside the gun show, allows gun vendors at gun shows to sell firearms with no background checks if they are sold from movable carts, makes it far more difficult to trace guns sold at a gun a show if they are later used in crime and would allow gun show dealers to ship a firearm across state lines directly to private residences. The Hyde McCullum bill also opens up a massive new gun safety lock loophole, a loophole to include in the definition any device, quote, that if removed will prevent the discharge of the firearm. Now, since every handgun has parts that when removed will prevent the handgun from discharging, including the firing pin, the trigger, the hammer, the magazine, their provisions effectively exempts all handguns from the safety device requirement. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a loophole. This is a broadening. A, a, this, this will defeat the intention of every sincere member of Congress to provide effective uh, gun safety legislation. And I strongly and strenuously uh, uh, object to this because there's never been any hearings. We've never had any hearings whatsoever. Now, we uh, in a national crisis deserve to bring more common sense response. Consider that 13 young people are killed daily, every day, by gun shootings. In 1996, 4,600 young people were killed by firearms. And nearly 10% of high school students reported carrying a gun in the last 30 days to school. To date, this process, the procedural process, has been extremely disappointing. It has been a, a broken, it has broken the fairness of regular order. And it has, in my judgment, been a ruse to kill the good work that the other body, the Senate, has done. And so any, any rule that doesn't take serious strides to rectify this unfairness and disorder, I do not think will be supported by the majority of the members of the House of Representatives. Uh, please, I plead with this committee, let us move in an orderly fashion to con consider as many of these amendments in a reasonable uh, period of time. Uh, since we have waited over Memorial Day, we should move as, as deliberately as we possibly can, not only in the committee, but in the, the work product that this committee crafts, so that we will be able to bring forth a, a work that will be worthy of the name and the considerations and concerns 
of literally all of the members that are in this body. Thank you very much, Mr. Conyers. Uh, appreciate your. Uh, you certainly will have to. If I might, if I might just make a couple of comments first. I, let me uh, <clears throat> begin by saying that uh, perhaps I uh, understated my opening remarks when I said there would be some controversy uh, surrounding uh, this question as we move forward. Uh, but I will tell you that uh, as we go back to uh, mid-May. Uh, I've just been given a list of the, uh, the hearings that were held on the 13th of May. The full committee held a hearing on the Youth Culture and Juvenile Violence Act on the 27th of May. The full com committee held a hearing on the uh, juvenile crime related issues, including guns. And then I know that we have Mr. McCullum here. The subcommittee on crime has held uh, hearings on the gun related proposals. Let me also say that uh, I recall very well in this committee when we had uh, members who were before Memorial Day attempting to immediately get us to attach to appropriations measures, uh, the Senate passed legislation. And I know the meeting to which uh, my, uh, my friend referred that took place uh, among members of the leadership, I uh, was out of town then, but the report that I got uh, on that meeting was that an attempt would be made to move ahead with what would clearly be an expedited procedure and there was agreement uh, from the Democratic leadership that an attempt to move as quickly as possible uh, would in fact be uh, tried on our side. And I do know that we have had, again, uh, this month, the, the full committee has in fact held a hearing on this bill. And I'd like to say that there is not any plan for a substitute measure, and I want to say that as it relates to the additional bill, H.R. 2122, it's our intention to allow any members who wish to file amendments we on the Rules Committee, our staff, are uh, ready, willing, and able to assist members who, at this point, want to continue to submit amendments to us for consideration, and we will uh, do everything that we can to uh, make sure that they comply with the base text of the bill. And uh, with that, I'd like to call Mr. Hyde one to make some remarks. Well, thank you very much. I just very briefly want to say that uh, I, I continue to be surprised that we are criticized on the trigger lock issue because we have added two Democrat provisions, Senator Cole and Representative McCarthy's provision to strengthen that rather than weaken it. They persist in calling that a weakening. Um, also, what happened was on May 20th, we had the meeting that Mr. Conyers referred to with Mr. Gephardt and Mr. Bonnier and Mr. Conyers. Um, and. Um, we thought we had a format worked out where we would have um, our two staffs work over the Memorial Day holiday and then upon our return have legislation as close to agreement as we could reach. Um, the next day, the Democratic caucus vetoed that and we got a letter from Mr. Conyers uh, admitting, he said, after consulting with the Democratic caucus, it's clear there's a strong feeling that we're in the midst of a crisis which demands immediate legislative action. Now, he even suggests skipping the committee, which we did. He said, indeed, Mr. Speaker, the House has acted expeditiously on gun-related legislation in the past, skipping the Judiciary Committee altogether when it attempted to repeal the assault weapons ban in 1996. Now, he wants deliberate speed today, but on May 21st, he wanted instant action now in responding to the mandate of, of his caucus. So we've tried to proceed in a responsible way. Uh, we will have a full debate, and every member of the House can participate in it. I don't care how much time you want to allocate to this. Um, give Mr. Conyers all the time he wants to say, anything he wants, uh, and that holds true for every other member. The issue is too important, uh, and uh, we are simply moving ahead expeditiously, and they'll have, uh, I ask you to make in order any and all amendments that are serious amendments uh, so that a full debate can be had. Well, the chairman, you. The chairman Dreyer, you. I'm happy to yield. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Hyde has made reference to 2122, mm -hmm. H.R. 2122. You have made reference to H.R. 2122. The minority has not been given a copy of this. Is, is, when will this be available? 
Um, you will have it in just a few minutes. But that's the subject of, the, that's one of the two bills that's the subject of this hearing. It's one of the two bills that we're discussing right now, but the hearing is uh, being held, uh, we're discussing H.R. 1501, and that's what has allowed us to uh, proceed, but H.R. 2122 will be in your hands momentarily. It, Mr. Chairman, it is very difficult to ask questions of the chairman and of the ranking member of the committee mm -hmm. without having a copy of the bill. Mm -hmm. Can someone tell us what's in the bill? Yeah. Well, uh, again, we will have a copy of it for you in uh, just a few minutes. That's the, uh, we're expecting it up here. Well, but and, uh, and uh, if you'd like us to call back after we proceed with other witnesses, if you'd like us to call Mr. Hyde and Mr. Conyers back, I know they'd be more than well, happy to Well, when it's my time to answer. ask questions, I would like to ask Mr. Hyde if he knows what's in H.R. 2122 and if he can tell us, even if I don't have a copy of it. Okay, well, we, we uh, I haven't quite gotten to that. Help me here, Steph. you want to tell them what's in 2122? Well, I, well that's actually, uh, we're, we're, we're not allowed to have the staff actually well, answer these questions. Really and, the chairman Dreyer, Mr. Chairman, uh, there there were two points. If I could merely respond, uh, I, I I didn't know that uh, Chairman Hyde was going to quote me uh, in response to my presentation. But there are two things that that should be clear in the record. First, uh, yes, on May 13th there were hearings in Judiciary Committee, and there have been hearings on some of this of these measures. But there were no markup. There were no markups, there were no conclusions, mm -hmm. and that, I wanted to make that, that mm -hmm. clear from the beginning. Thank you. And then, uh, in the letter that he, he, he generously quoted from me, uh, we were referring to the Senate gun violence amendments and 1501, the bipartisan juvenile justice uh, measures. Uh, uh, so the, the process that we were caught in uh, we, we had no other alternative. I didn't mean that we were going to write unlimited amendments, 175, none of which have been vetted through the Judiciary Committee, and that we would come up here now and say, well, you once wanted to do this real quickly, so we're, now we're going to accommodate you. And I, I think that that explanation should be in the record. Thank you very much, Mr. Goss. Uh, Mr. Frost? Well, I would ask Mr. Hyde if he would take the time to perhaps have a short break and visit with the staff so that he could tell the committee what the, su what the substance of H.R. 2122 is. That's the subject of this hearing. That's, this is, we've been informed that this is an emergency item added to our agenda, and no one can tell us what's in it. Would the gentleman and, yield? And the chairman is Would the, the gentleman yield? Yes, I will yield. Thank you for yielding. And let me uh, just say that uh, the bill was introduced on Thursday by Mr. McCollum. He is the next witness scheduled to come forward, the chairman of the crime subcommittee, and I know that he is uh, poised to respond to uh, any question that you might uh, wish to pose on this. Well, if it were introduced on Thursday, why don't we have a copy? I don't understand this, Mr. Chairman. Well, as I said, it's on its way. Mr. Chairman, you gave it's us... It's being you, copied right... The staff right gave now. us a whole stack of all the other amendments, but they couldn't give us a copy of the, bi of the bill that's under consideration by this committee. Now, Mr. Chairman, I try and be very patient, and I have a great... We appreciate great, that. ...great respect for, for you as chairman of this committee, and I have a great respect for Mr. Hyde. And I, during the impeachment proceedings, I went out of my way to say nice things about Mr. Hyde because of his, uh, I believe that Mr. Hyde is a fair-minded man. This committee cannot function on this important a matter. We are the committee of original jurisdiction for all practical purposes in this legislation. We cannot function if we don't have a copy of the bill that we're, under, we're considering in front of us. And if the chairman of the Judiciary Committee can't tell us what's in the bill. I can tell the, you, I've been advised okay. by staff. Everything I said about the gun shows, I testified extensively earlier today. That's what's in the bill. All right, so if I understand correctly, then it is the first part of your testimony. Your testimony actually was divided into two parts. That's correct. Not and the I've cultural, but the, the access to, to, uh, to weapons, the gun show part. All right, that's 20, and with that had previously been described to us, and there had been material circulated by the media and by others, it said this was 2037, but I guess this is the updated version That's of, correct. Of, of 2037. That is right. All right, and then is there another piece of legislation that incorporates your cultural provisions? Yes, sir. 
Well, that 1501 was the, uh, the original yes. bill. Uh, it's an amendment to oh, 15, it's an amendment to 15. It's an amendment to 1501. All right, and that's what uh, this is something that we do. We were handed that says the protecting the children from cultural violence. Right. So what we're really talking, if I understand correctly now, what we're really talking about is the updated version of the gun show provisions right. uh, is one piece of legislation. And the other piece of legislation is the, uh, is the cultural, the children, protecting children from cultural violence. That's right. Now, where do all the trigger lock provisions and the other provisions that are not directly That's, related to gun? Those are separate amendments. Those are not part of 2122? They're, not, no, they're, not, no, they're not lumped in with the gun, with the, uh, gun show provisions? No, sir. This is very hard to follow, Mr. Hyde. Well, not really. It's just look at the gun show as separate. Okay, so gun show stands by itself. Sui generis, as you lawyers say. That's, I understand. As it stands by itself, so it's been separated out, culled out from all the other gun provisions. Good word, culled I, out. I do have some, since that, we've now established what, if I understand correctly, what the situation is, I do have some questions about gun shows. Sure. If I may. Um, It's a, it is, it's a separate piece of legislation, if I understand correctly, that oh, we don't have yet. Both bills at the same time. Yes. Yes. That's what That's he said at the beginning. That's what he said at the beginning of the hearing. I was trying to... The answer is no. Nobody has a copy. No. No, nobody has a copy. The point is nobody has a copy. If I could reclaim my time. Was 2122 a substitute for 1501? No. Apparently it's an additional bill, Ms. Slaughter, and we have not been given a copy of it yet. Well, I, I can tolerate that, but I don't know how why we debate two bills at the same time. That, that, that seems... Well, if, if I may you continue may. with Excuse my me. questioning, and, and I, I think it's a valid question to pursue. Uh, Mr. Hyde, um, we have a lot of gun shows in my part of the country, and um, you testified about this previously, about the length of gun shows. It's, sometimes they're a day or two. Sometimes they're longer, sure. but sometimes they're a day or two. Now. If there is a 72-hour provision or a three-day provision, what happens if the gun show isn't that long? How do, how, do you, how do you do your check if the gun show is only a day or two, if you've got a three-day provision or if you've got a 72-hour provision? Do you just, is it just the case that the person comes in and orders the gun, but it's not delivered until after the check is made? That's is that right. what happens? And it can be delivered by common carry. By common carry. Yeah. Uh, is that current law? Is that, is that what you would anticipate then? Yes, sir. Okay. If that's the case, then why does it make any difference if it's 72 hours or three days? If the gun show is already over and if it can be delivered by common carrier, why have it 72 hours as opposed to, uh, to three working days? more workable using calendar days than business days. Well, it, it is, I understand, but it, it is a, a lessening or a changing from the Senate provision. And I understand that there's an interest in perhaps refining Senate provisions, but I, I, this seems to me like a, a peculiar refinement. If the gun show is already over, what difference does it make whether it's uh, calendar days or, or business days? This is an effort at compromise and Nobody gets everything they want in a compromise. Well, it just seems like a peculiar compromise to me. That was the only, because um, now let me uh, let me go back to uh, to some of the other questions, uh, some of the other issues here. If is it, I guess it will be clear to the witnesses um, which piece of legislation they should attach their amendments to. Um, Mr. Conyers has a has a substitute, and I don't know how he divides up his substitute. If it's uh, if you've got the gun provision, gun show provisions, and a standalone piece of legislation, and then you have other things as amendments to 1501, Mr. Conyers somehow has got to decide how he how he divides up his substitute. If I uh, if I understand correctly, because his substitute really would apply to two different bills. I guess the rules committee will have to make that decision. I would urge the faci facilitating of Mr. Conyers' amendment. Uh, Mr. Conyers, would you, you have any thoughts on that? 
Well, what I'm going to have to do now is either write at uh, probably two different substitutes. We, we only had one bill when I was doing a democratic substitute. Now we have two. Uh, it is not clear to me what's going to end up in the newer bill that we're awaiting. So I will either have to put the substitute on one or the other or create two substitutes. And I, I would ask that the, the Rules Committee keep that as in I, as I said, uh, As I said a few minutes ago, we anxiously look forward to working with you and members of your staff to uh, facilitate that uh, so that all of your concerns are addressed. And let me also say that as we look at the litany of proposals before us, uh, it is fully my intention as, as chairman of the committee to ensure that when we proceed with our work on the House floor that we address uh, the juvenile Brady Amendment, the trigger lock amendment, the large capacity feeding devices amendment, the purchase by those under the age of 21, uh, the possessing of guns by juveniles, and the Dingle Gun Show Amendment, and the uh, McCarthy Gun Show Amendment. Now, I'm, I can't tell you exactly how the committee will decide, but as chairman of the committee, I'm hoping very much that we will be able to consider all of those measures on the House floor as we uh, proceed with debate. And so I think that many of the concerns uh, that have been raised will uh, be able to be um, addressed with that. I would, uh, Mr. Chairman, we now have a copy of 2122 and it's still warm. <laughs> it has uh, obviously recently been um, copied, um, but I appreciate the fact that we have it. And uh, it does make an interesting situation because, uh, um, and this was not clear at the beginning of the hearing, but it is clear now that the House may be asked to vote just on the gun show provision standalone as a separate piece of legislation. And then they may be asked to vote on everything else. Um, and it's unclear, as I understand from what you said at the beginning of the hearing, which we would vote on first. If we did, if we did have two separate bills and what the order would be. Um, I do have, uh, I'm not sure when it's appropriate, Mr. Chairman. I have a statement from a member who is who's not here, but I, I will insert that the record at the Without appropriate time. That, uh, statement, uh, That's from, from Mr. Meehan. Mr. Meehan, Meehan that will appear in the record. It's following the testimony of the uh, Chairman. Um, I, I would ask, uh, um, there are, uh, Mr. Hyde, there are some provisions in the Democratic substitute not dealing with guns. Um, some provisions dealing with uh, additional uh, police officers to the COPS program um, with uh, counselors, funding for counselors. And if I understanding, and, and I have offered those as separate amendments, Congressman Menendez, Congressman Bonnier and I introduced legislation that incorporated those provisions, and we are offering those as separate amendments. Presumably they would be to 1501, they would not be to 2122. Um, is there any reason why uh, those provi those type provisions have not been brought forward by you or by Mr. McCollum or other members of the committee? Well, on the COPS program, um, uh, that's a worthwhile inquiry. Uh, I'm not sure how successful the existing program has been. I've read some criticism that the 100000 that was promised uh, is a long way from being attained, and so to superimpose another program on one that has some problems with it would be problematic, but uh, I, I think it's worth taking a look at by all means. Well, I can tell you, Mr. Hyde, that this is a, very, a program that has been very successfully done by several suburban communities in my congressional district. Some communities that it's it working is, fine, it is an sure. ex No, I'm talking about cops and schools. There oh, is a program of police officers in the schools oh, I'm sorry, that's in different. suburban, and that's what I am, my amendment would in, would allocate 10,000 police officers for stationing in schools. I'm informed the crime subcommittee has a hearing scheduled next week on that proposal. And also, what about funding for additional counselors in the schools? I have met with uh, educators, both the teachers and with administrators in my congressional district, both prior to the most recent incident and afterwards. And in all those meetings, they have discussed the need for additional counselors. We heard witnesses who said these huge high schools where there's one counselor for a thousand kids. I mean, no question there's an imbalance. I think it's a very important issue, and 
there will be hearings on that as but, well. But there's nothing in the legislation that you have advanced. No, we did not. We did not that uh, include that. Wouldn't it be an appropriate time to consider that type of uh, approach while we're trying to deal with this entire problem? I would not object to an violence? amendment. To, uh, uh, I would not object to that. It's up to the uh, rules committee. But I, I just want you to know that regular order, if we ever return to it, will uh, <laughs> see that you get. Uh, it, it did uh, not apply in this case. No, course. it did not. I, I was persuaded by Mr. Conyers that we should rush ahead. The gentleman yield, I'd just yes. like to, to say that uh, we are expecting Chairman Goodley, Goodling from the Education and Workforce Committee to testify in behalf of an amendment that would address uh, many of the uh, issues that the gentleman has raised. Um, I have no other questions at this Thank time. Thank you very much. Mr. Slender. Any questions uh, per se? I, I'm I'm still kind of perplexed at doing two bills at the same time, but I'm sure we're up to that. I guess um, I do have an amendment, which I think will probably be to 1501, uh, to do something about after-school programs for children who just get lost and live in the shadows, and the time when the crime rate goes up in every afternoon from between the hours of three and eight. And uh, I hope that neither of you gentlemen would have any objections to that. I'd support that. I, I didn't. What was your suggestion, Louise? Mr. Hyde, I've got an amendment to 1501 uh, for after-school programs to keep the kids busy, if doing something sure. productive That's and good, and getting important. their work done, their school work done. I would encourage that being offered. I thank you. We live in interesting times, don't we? Don't we? <laughs> don't we? Thank you very much. Thank you, Mrs. Slaughter. Mr. Sessions. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, uh, chairman, I've just had uh, given to both the uh, chairman and the ranking uh, member a, a, memor a letter which was sent on June the 2nd to the Attorney General of the United States, signed by you, asking for information about the uh, NICS system. Uh, in particular, there had been, as you may recall, uh, Steny Hoyer, Congressman Hoyer, uh, and I had engaged in some uh, discussion about uh, the limitations, the actual use of the NICS system. And I just wanted both these uh, gentlemen from judiciary to know that as of today, we have yet to hear from the Attorney General of the United States about this important issue. It is now 12 days that the Attorney General has had this and your staff has made a call today. So I'm very hopeful that uh, in order to consider this legislation, that we would at least hear from the Attorney General with a reasonable request that is taken forth from this committee. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much, and we will look forward to that response. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Moakley. I... Sorry, I had to step away, Mr. Chairman. Absolutely. Uh, I'm sorry I had this, but I had a, a very important, maybe not as important, as, but it was an important meeting I had to attend to. Uh, John, what is your problem with the 2122 bill? The, uh, what is your, your main problem to it? Well, the, the first thing is that uh, we were only advised uh, this afternoon that this was going to be a, a companion bill before the Rules Committee. We have been operating under the uh, understanding that we would take the uh, Juvenile Justice Bill, 1501, and the Senate gun provisions and put them together. Uh, now we have uh, a gun show provision here that from the most I can make out is that it's, it is not a meaningful compromise that has been referred to. Because if we have a holiday weekend, uh, state courts are closed, there, there's, there's not going to be a background check uh, in three calendar days. Uh, therein is, is uh, one of the big problems. And by putting these these uh, other provisions uh, that I that I referred to about uh, the ways that you can incapacitate a gun in, uh, well, if you if you uh, take out the magazine or the the trigger or anything like that, the gun is incapacitated. But that is not a meaningful uh, trigger lock provision. And therein is uh, one of the, the big uh, objections that, that go to this uh, this trigger lock proposal. That does I've this been affect 
does this affect which bill your amendment would be applied to then? Are you a substitute? Well, uh, we're, we're going to have to go through. We have no idea what the, the work of this body is. You've actually become the, the body of original jurisdiction. So uh, until you've operated, uh, it, it's hard to tell. Uh, it, 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 it could go on, on the, the next bill, the second bill that has been recently added. Uh, and to, for my notice, it was this afternoon. So it, it puts us, uh, as well as you, in an incredible position in trying to deal with a subject that we all agree is, is important. I, I, I guess I'm old fashioned. I wanted to do one bill at a time. Uh, we wanted to take the time that is necessary. If, if we're going to telescope this all into uh, uh, two bills into uh, uh, a couple of days for the rule, and then we're going to go out on the floor uh, with 175 amendments uh, that have been offered to you, uh, it, it, it's not clear what, what kind of uh, work you're going to give back to us. And if it is necessary that we come back to testify uh, on uh, or to make any clarification on this, uh, I would be be happy to try to do so, and I assume the chairman would as well. Let the gentleman yield again. I will just say that that we uh, do have staff that is ready to uh, to work with you. In fact, we have a very able former judiciary committee staff member who is here and yep. ready, willing, and able to work with you on your amendments and any other amendments that that not only members of your committee uh, might have, but uh, other members of the uh, of the House. Thank you for yielding. Uh, well, but I, I think, too, uh, that you, that might be great to have all that staff, but they still don't have the time to put their amendments together if they don't want, know what bills that are well, coming they do, through they, here. They, they do, and I'm saying that we will work with uh, them. How much time are you going to give them to get their amendments together? Well, uh, we're, we're You just have Mr. Carney's here. What about the 172 people who want to speak on the bill? Would you then, would you then give them time, maybe a couple of days, to get their amendments in order so they know which well, bill they can put in? Doing our to try and address those uh, right. right now. Henry, you may have answered this question. I'm sorry, I wasn't there. Is there any reason that the the gun show bill has to be separate from the the other bill that was going through? Why 2122 was necessary? Is that what's not our decision? That is your committee's decision. Oh, it was, oh, our committee's decision. Oh, Mr. Chairman, can you tell me why it was... Not my decision. Can you tell me why it was necessary? Uh, well, this juncture, um, <laughs> we haven't finally made a decision. Exactly. Oh, maybe you can ask the person who thought it was necessary to do it, and then you could tell all of us, and so we'd all be in on it. expand opportunities to debate this contentious issue. It is a contentious issue on but, but gun shows. Mr. And Chairman. This is to facilitate a wider debate. But Mr. Chairman, if that were that necessary, you have the intelligence yourself, and I'm very, very proud of you, your ability to do it. Why would you have to wait for the Rules Committee to make up the, the mind that they had to need another committee bill? You should have been, been able to do that. Well, really into these technical questions. Oh, this is a technical question. Like committee hearings, yes. technical questions. Yes. Uh, so you still don't know why we have it? No, no, basically, I mean, uh, clearly there are two very separate areas here. We're focusing Aren't they similar, on the, though? Aren't they similar? Well, though? let me just explain, if I may. We're focusing on the cultural side with the consequences for Juvenile Offenders Act, and we are focusing on the gun issue separately. So and with sep 175 amendments, that have been submitted to us, and our goal of trying to make sure that everyone is able to uh, participate in this process, uh, I'm convinced that this will be a very balanced approach, and we all know that the founders desperately wanted the process of lawmaking to be done inefficiently, and we're setting sort of a model for them here. But, but uh, some of the gun provisions you see mixed in with the cultural yeah. provisions, if I understand the testimony. Yeah. The trigger I mean, lock and some of the other things would be in with the cultural provisions. I think you're culture and guns. I don't know what kind of stew you're going to end up with. <laughs> well, we're convinced it'll be a very good bill once we uh, have a final but, so Knowing was, that the House will have worked. Was your decision then to, to 
put this uh, gun show in a different bill when you found out how many amendments were going to be made to the bill? No, no, no. We, that was not, that didn't go into the decision well, here. Well, I thought you just said it's because of all the amendments were here that you, you tried to separate the cultural from the guns. We're trying to have the opportunity for a full and open debate on both aspects of this issue. That is our goal here. But don't you think we're, we're being a little uh, overbearing then for us to write a bill when, no, the, I the, don't. when the committee uh, of jurisdiction had written a bill already on the subject matter? But we well, yielded, we're obviously we yielded to you, certainly. Uh, and, and we're obviously getting a great deal of input from them and a litany of other members who are anxiously looking forward well, to I'm testifying before this Well, I'm getting a great committee. deal of input knowing it's my committee that's responsible for 2122. We are going to patiently sit while 101 other of our colleagues testify here about the way that they uh, look forward to seeing us proceed. And uh, I can hardly wait. Mr. Mokwe, I can tell you that, that Thank you, this Mr. new uh, amendment on, on uh, guns is going to reopen the debate uh, that the Senate bill would have closed once and for all. I mean, we would have had a big enough debate on that alone, but now we're going to have conflicting ones. We're going to have the uh, 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 flea markets will not be covered. We're going to have... Uh, Does that come out the cultural or guns, flea markets now? How, how would I know? I have no idea. The, the let's step outside uh, and talk about this, which allows vendors to complete, complete transactions of gun sales with no background checks. The roving vendor now gets into the act. Uh, the, the roving, roving vendor. Yes. <laughs> yes. He, he Sounds like the Shakespearean play, but go ahead. The stationary vendors. Uh, we're guaranteeing that, that criminals who would have been prevented from guns under the Senate bill will, will be able to get under them by the House in the House bill by weakening current Brady background checks. So I, I see, I see a, a, a very wide differentiation of what we would have been doing uh, had not the second bill been brought to to uh, from the rules committee or from whatever source it came from. Thank you. You adequately answered my question. Thank you very much. And let me let me just say that uh, I think it's very important that we proceed uh, with the deliberative uh, procedure here rather than uh, just ceding to the United States Senate. I think that having seen that bill that came forward, Mr. Hyde uh, said there are many good things in it, but we obviously uh, want to improve on their work product, and I'm convinced that we're going to have a chance to do that. Gentlemen, thank you very much for uh, uh, working with us on this, and again, I will uh, say that uh, we look forward to whatever modifications or changes you want to make to your amendments to uh, H.R. 2122, and we will uh, Thank try you, our Mr. Chairman. To work. We yeah, can come I'll... back if it's required. Great. Thank you all very much. Our next witness is the uh, chairman of the Crime Subcommittee, Mr. McCullum, and uh, the author of H.R. 2122. And we will um, welcome uh, a summary. Now I guess we have only 100 witnesses to go following your presentation, and we uh, look forward to them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, if I can be very brief, uh, I will be uh, in every respect, but let me suggest a, a one thing as a predicate. Uh, we're here today to deal with legislation concerning child safety and juvenile violent crime. And the issue of child safety and juvenile violent crime arose long before Littleton and long before the reaction to some loopholes that were discovered in some of the gun laws that many people have been addressing in the media for several days and that we will be addressing appropriately in, in the coming legislation this week. But it strikes me, having chaired this subcommittee for some time, that without seeing the broader perspective and the fact that we have a bipartisan base bill here in 1501, which every member of the subcommittee on crime, both Democrat and Republican, signed off on a prior to the Littleton affair, it is probably not the proper perspective for us to proceed with unless we understand that. Number one, it strikes me there are a number of things that cause juvenile violence that uh, we really can't address very easily legislatively. Uh, there is a, a well-understood 
acceptance of the fact that a lack of consequences at an early age, a, a lack of parenting, a lack of mentoring, uh, are all contributory factors, and that's difficult to, uh, to get around in legislation to resolve. Those are social questions that, that are there and, and they're pregnant, but they're not something that's easy to grasp in, the, in a legislative detail. In our schools, uh, we don't see discipline today the way we should have it, and many people acknowledge that. Uh, that's a matter, again, that federal legislation to resolve is not a simple matter to do. But one of the things that all of these sociologists, the juvenile judges, the probation officers, <laughs> attorneys generals throughout the 50 states told our subcommittee over several years that was a very significant factor in violent crime among juveniles today was the fact that there was an absence of consequences in the juvenile justice system. That when somebody goes out as a kid, uh, 14, 15, 16 years old, and they spray paint graffiti on a warehouse wall, they slash tires, they rip out a radio out of a car, they commit basic vandalism that all too often in our major cities and many of our suburban communities, there are no consequences to those acts today uh, for several principal reasons. The main one being that most state juvenile justice systems are broken and aren't working because they're overworked and they're overtaxed. There aren't enough juvenile judges, there aren't enough probation officers, there aren't enough diversion programs and so on. The reality is that many times police officers, never having seen one of these youngsters do an act like this, never even take the youngster into juvenile authorities because they don't expect there to be any punishment or any consequences for that kind of an act as opposed to a more serious crime uh, down the road. And yet the, the experts all have said to, to Bobby Scott, to me and to others who've dealt with this matter, that it is indeed at the early stages when a child does an act like this or multiple acts like this, receiving no punishment, no community service, nothing, that that in itself is a principal reason why later uh, they're going to commit violent crimes and lead on to much more difficulties in the juvenile system. So the base bill here, 1501, which again is a bipartisan bill often overlooked in this discussion, probably is the most significant thing that we in Congress can do to legislatively assist in eliminating and, uh, and alleviating so much violence among youth today. That bill is very simple. It provides a grant program to the states over the next several years uh, based upon the rate of violent crime in that state among juveniles and based upon those states' populations. And it provides that the state may use the money to improve its juvenile justice system any way it sees fit within a range of about 13 categories. They can hire more juvenile judges, more probation officers, build a detention facility, have more diversion programs, assist with school safety, whatever is required that they choose to do in their choice and not ours, with only one condition to this money. And that one condition is that the states assure the United States Attorney General that every juvenile misdemeanor crime, every vandalism, every spray painting graffiti, every running over a parking meter, every ripping off of a car of a radio gets some sanction that it comes in their state before a juvenile authority and some sanctions given. Not necessarily detention time, could be community service, could be any a number of a range of things, but that that happens. This, in my judgment, being overlooked is the base bill, is the most important thing we're being considering in all of this. However, having said that, I've got a couple of things to say. 21, 22, as well as 2037 were bills that bear my name and Mr. Hyde's. They've been discussed here today. Uh, 21, 22 is very simple. It's taken from 2037. It's simply sections 401 and 402 dealing with the gun show issue. Uh, and what I'm proposing as an amendment today before you, in addition to that bill as a separate bill, is amendment number 60, which takes much of the rest of 2037, not dealing with the the triggers uh, lock safety locks and the gun issues directly, but all of the punishments and, and a number of other things and asking that that amendment be made in order to 1501. And as separate from that, Mr. Hyde has asked for the cultural bill that uh, he had introduced as a separate amendment to be made in order. But my amendment, number 60, deals with several things, and I'll be again as brief as possible. Number one, it deals with federal juvenile justice reform, something the administration's asked for for a long time. Separate apart from what we do in the grant program in 1501, it would provide uh, some relief for the federal system for those very limited number of cases involving juveniles at the federal level, most of the time off of Indian reservations, giving prosecutors at the federal level the same discretion uh, that prosecutors in most states are given with regard to when to charge uh, crimes uh, it allows fines and supervised release uh, to be, uh, which are not presently sentencing options, to be sentencing options, and it does a number of other things that I will trust that you'll look at the outline of rather than my running through all of that. Secondly, uh, in addition, 
the amendment would provide a number of increases in penalties uh, in order to limit juvenile access to firearms. Uh, it increases the maximum penalty, for example, that may be imposed on juveniles who illegally possess a firearm. It increases the maximum penalty that may be imposed on adults who illegally transfer firearms to juveniles. It enacts a new provision to prohibit any person under 21 from sending, receiving, or possessing explosive materials. Another title in this amendment, or another section of it, would uh, deter criminals from gaining access to firearms and, and explosives by prohibiting the distribution through the internet and elsewhere of information relating to explosive devices, etc. cetera, uh, when the person who distributes the information knows the recipient intends to use or cause harm to others. It requires common carriers like UPS or Federal Express to report the theft or loss of a firearm in shipping uh, within 48 hours after the loss is discovered. Another section of the bill deals with punishing and deterring the criminal use of firearms and explosives and numerous increases in penalties regarding the discharge of a firearm in a school zone, for example, providing a mandatory minimum punishment for the knowing discharge of a firearm in a school zone, and the increase of punishments if physical harm occurs, provides for the increase in maximum penalties for transporting stolen firearms in interstate commerce for selling, receiving, or possessing stolen firearms. It increases the minimum mandatory penalty for discharging a firearm during a federal crime of violence or drug trafficking crime, and a number of others that I think are very important. Again, I'm trying to summarize, but it's a very extensive amendment, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the, uh, the last section of this amendment deals with punishing gang violence and drug trafficking to minors. It contains provisions that increase the existing mandatory minimum penalty that's imposed on adults convicted of using minors to distribute drugs. It increases existing mandatory penalties that must be imposed on any person convicting of distributing, possessing, with the intent to distribute or manufacturing drugs within 100 feet of a school zone. And it also deals with the question of gang-related witness intimidation by establishing a federal offense for traveling in interstate commerce or foreign commerce with the intent to delay or influence the testimony of a witness in a state criminal proceeding by bribery, force, or intimidation, or a threat directed against any person. And it includes a death penalty for somebody who goes across the state line to kill a witness in such a situation. It is, as I said, a comprehensive amendment, and I certainly urge uh, that it, it, it is appropriate that it be allowed to 1501. It was a part of the Bill 2037 that Mr. Hyde and I introduced, uh, every part of what's in this amendment, uh, but it has uh, been segregated out, as was indicated earlier. Again, 2122 is a separate bill dealing with the gun issues directly, but this dealing with the punishments. The, the next area I'd like to mention in the brief time I've got here, Mr. Chairman, is that I have a separate uh, a suggestion about two amendments that are pending uh, that are not mine. One of them deals with Mr. Salmon's amendment called Amy's Law. It has been a bill that's before our committee. I know he's asking to offer it to 1501 before you during this hearing. Uh, I would urge you to allow him to offer that amendment. In simple terms, it provides that when a state releases a prisoner early who's committed certain very heinous crimes, and that prisoner who's been released early then goes to another state and commits a crime uh, within a certain period of time, that the state that released this prisoner early has to bear the cost of the trial and the incarceration of this uh, con convict who they released early uh, with regard to the other state. The other amendment that I think it, that should be made in order, not that you won't make others in order, is one that uh, Mr. Cunningham is going to propose before you, dealing with something that police have requested of us for a long time, uh, that police officers be permitted to carry concealed weapons across state lines if they are indeed a, a police officers and certified to be that way. And I'm sure Mr. Cunningham will explain it. And last but not least, I have a separate amendment of my own that's before the committee that I would certainly like to see adopted that conforms with something that's in the Senate bill. Uh, it was extraneously put in there, but it's very crucial. Mr. Hyde, the chairman of the full judiciary committee, and Mr. Coble, the chairman of the court subcommittee, have endorsed this proposal. It would grant relief in three districts, judicial districts, that are extremely pressed today for judges. And this amendment uh, is one which affects the Middle District of Florida, where we have a judicial conference request for five additional judges today, which is by far the largest judicial conference report request in the entire nation, uh, from a district that's extraordinarily overworked uh, and under-accommodated uh, in terms of its, its uh, work that's there to be done. There have not been any new additional judges in that district or in the state of Florida since 1990. We've had an enormous population increase and a caseload increase of 60% in that district since that time. The amendment I propose is, 
uh, does not go with all of the judges that might come out of the Judicial Conference, but my understanding is the other body has put in their legislation uh, provisions for four, not all five of the judges the Judicial Conference recommends in this district, and uh, for three judges in Arizona and three in Nevada in those districts which have the most pressure right now in hopes that we can get some relief in those really high growth districts of our nation where the population's grown. As you know, in Las Vegas, Nevada, it's grown tremendously. In Arizona, the growth is tremendous. And in Florida, in the Middle District, which encompasses Jacksonville, Orlando, Tampa, to Naples, it has grown tremendously. And while uh, a separate bill might be the more appropriate vehicle under normal circumstances, my understanding that is improbable to come out of committee again uh, anytime soon. And certainly, with the Senate having acted already on it, I would urge that amendment to be adopted, or at least allowed on the floor, I should say, uh, by the Rules Committee, uh, narrowly crafted for this bill. And thank you very much. I've done my best to summarize. Thank you very much, Mr. McComb. We, we appreciate that. I'd like to uh, call first on the co-author of uh, the amendment that you uh, just mentioned, the Vice Chairman of the Committee, Mr. Goss. Well, thank you very much, Mr. McComb. You've given us uh, a very good uh, background, and I'm, in some ways I'm sorry we didn't have it before we started the hearing because you've made clear uh, an awful lot that wasn't clear for some members who obviously did not have the opportunity to get here and uh, get as much homework done as was necessary before this started. So I appreciate you doing that. Uh, secondly, um, I uh, very much want to associate myself with your remarks. It strikes me that we have uh, many tragedies uh, to look at in this country and to do a comprehensive uh, review of what goes wrong when something horrible goes wrong uh, requires getting beyond the emotion of the moment and getting down into the rational problems. And I think clearly that there are a number of things we must do and uh, the comprehensive approach uh, that you've outlined seems to me to be very much in order. The particular aspect with regard to Florida I totally associate with. Uh, I, too, have an amendment uh, which I believe is precisely the same as yours, and I'm uh, honored that it is. Seems to me that if you don't have enforcement, uh, the law doesn't do much good. Uh, and having an empty courthouse makes a mockery of justice, and we have an empty courthouse in Fort Myers. You have to go six hours driving uh, to get relief, to go to a court, and you just can't do uh, anything in the way of proper and speedy justice uh, with that kind of a situation that apparently pertains throughout the Middle District of Florida and in other areas that you've provided for in your amendment. So I associate myself very much for that, and I hope that we can take care of all of these points uh, and at least the most egregious areas where we need judges. Uh, if we could do that much with this legislation, uh, it would be a big step forward. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. That's correct, Mr. Uh, Mr. Moakley. I, I did Mr. put Dryan, that bill in. That's does correct. Mr. Dryan know that? Well, I Mr. announced that. I announced that in the middle of the hearing. It was Mr. Hyatt. Oh, but I thought you said you, it was the, the Rules Committee put the 2122 in. No, no, no. I announced, I announced that Mr. Hyatt, Mr. Hyde, Mr. Conyers were testifying, and Mr. McCullum was, in fact, the author of 2122. Okay. Is there any reason we couldn't have got 2122 at the same time we got 1501? Well, I don't know any reason why you didn't. It was introduced last Thursday, so I think it's oh, purely technical. Oh, all that time, huh? Uh, it was introduced. The reason why was because of the request of our leadership, as I think Mr. Dreyer has explained, to break out the gun show provisions 401 and 402 and to provide a separate bill before your rules committee so that those issues related directly uh, to safety locks and so forth might be offered as amendments to the gu a, a freestanding bill that was not the same as 1501, uh, and that all other amendments be offered, as I understand it, to 1501. So that's why I've offered Amendment Number 60, I explained earlier, that has a lot of the provisions in it that uh, are related to juvenile violence, but are not directly related to the issue of, of guns or gun shows. Well, where the matter is so controversial, and uh, there are so many amendments, uh, it's so confusing. I would think that one bill would probably be the best way to go so that people would know what amendment goes where and whether it's really affecting our culture or our guns or our kids or what. And, and I just don't see for the life of me why the gun show provision would have to be out of the, the 1501. Well, if I might respond only to this extent, I introduced with Mr. Hyde a bill called H.R. 2037. It's sitting here. You've probably seen it. It's been discussed for a couple of weeks. There's nothing in, in the... Uh, New bill 2122 that isn't here. It's in 401, 402 section, and most of the rest of, but not all, of the bill of 2037 is in the amendment number 60. I'm proposing to offer 
uh, presumably to 1501. But again, I'm only following the guidelines that were given to me, the suggestion that a separate bill would be appropriate. It's up to you all to decide. If you want to, if you have a, a group uh, agreement among the Rules Committee to proceed with 2037, I, I that's guess, fine with me. I guess what I'm asking is who's suggesting that you this should be a separate bill? This was suggested by Mr. Dreyer and by our Republican majority leadership. So what is your fault? Oh, okay. All right. I just... No, I'm not... But I introduced the bill, but he, he and the others in our leadership suggested that the vehicle be provided to you as an option. And it's there. Obviously, you haven't uh, debated it or ruled on it. You may choose to go some other route, but it's there as a freestanding bill if that's the route you choose to go. Uh, does the Committee on the Judiciary look at this at all? The Committee on Judiciary looked at the whole thing, but not as a committee. In other words, it was commit the subcommittee... Was it by invitation only? Or? Well, it's the whole story is the question of whether or not we came to the floor through the Rules Committee directly or whether we marked up this legislation. Neither 2037 nor 2122 have been through the full Judiciary Committee. 1501, the Juvenile Justice Bill, has been it through our subcommittee and has completely bipartisan support, every Democrat and every Republican. It did not come out of the full uh, Judiciary Committee. It was waiting for Mark uh, when this decision was made to come forward. As I said, uh, the Littleton occurrence precipitated a lot of uh, impetus to move legislation rapidly, as even some on your side and your leadership have requested. Yeah, so but even with the Littleton happened. thing, you still delayed our request to have this thing on the floor right away. It took, still took two weeks. Well, it took about two or three weeks, and I'd say that's pretty darn fast, considering the complexity of this legislation, Mr. Markley. Right, but I guess what you're telling me is the members of the Judiciary Committee didn't have input into this bill? Not in terms of a markup. They did have input in terms of discussing with the committee subcommittee staff in crime and the full Judiciary Committee staff. And I understand Mr. Hyde and Mr. Conyers had some conversations. Whether they agreed upon it, I don't. But there was no formal markup of the legislation. Uh, was there any committee participation in 2122? 2122 is simply a breakout of two sections of 2037. And, and the, answer is the, same. Bill, the answer is the same for both. There was no participation? No, no formal committee proceedings. Well, the committee is a formal, the committee is a formal function though, isn't it? It is normally a formal function, oh, but at but the request, again, I understand of both leaderships, we have produced legislation to you uh, without going through committee and for the final markup. This was not a decision just to do this by the Democrat or Republican leadership. The request to come forward with some proposal to the Rules Committee, as I understand it, has, and it's been even in the newspapers, is something that both your leader and ours requested. So that's what we've done, although that's not what the committee normally would like to do, nor would I. Am I mistaken? Or did I hear a couple of weeks ago that we, this was going to get full committee attention and the Judiciary Committee would be marked up? And we originally hoped that that would occur, but then... Uh, was that the statement request made? Of, the request of your... And again, I, that's beyond my pay grade, but my understanding is that the request of your leadership initially was that we not go through the committee. Our leadership suggested that we do go through committee and somewhere along the way, our leadership acquiesced to yours, and here we the are for the yield, Rules uh, Committee. Yes. I, I, I just go back to what was a May 20th meeting that took place uh, among uh, members of both Democratic and Republican leaderships, and the desire then was to see this move as expeditiously as possible. Um, Mr. Mokley, you've just said that there's been two weeks added. Uh, hearings were held on H.R. 1501, as well as in the Crime sub Subcommittee. Uh, in the Subcommittee, Mr. Chairman. In the, in the crime, well, the full committee on H.R. 1501, and in the crime subcommittee, I mean, it's true that the full committee held hearings on H.R. 1501, is that correct? I believe that's correct. We certainly marked up 50, we even marked up 1501 in the subcommittee. We've had hearings, there's no right. dispute. 1501, Mr. Chairman, right. is a totally bipartisan product. And H.R. 2037 is a measure which, when did you first introduce H.R. 2037? Let's see if I have a date on it here. June 8th. June 8th. June 8th. June 8th. June 8th. And so, uh, obviously, and, and again, this 2122 is, as Mr. McComb said, a breakout of uh, the two provisions in H.R. 2037. Uh, so I think that what we're really dealing with here is, I mean, and I remember, Joe, when you offered to one of the appropriations bills uh, an amendment to make an order, the juvenile justice bill, on the floor, and that was before the Memorial Day break. And so uh, I, I think that, I mean, from my perspective, we've reached some sort of compromise. You're not particularly happy with it. We've got members who aren't ecstatic, but people, as I said in my opening statement, people do want to see us move ahead with this legislation, and it's our hope that we'll be able to do so on uh, Wednesday. Well, I'm not too sure that a lot of people see us want to move ahead with this legislation. I think they would like some adequate gun legislation. Well, I mean, we're going to hopefully have every measure, uh, the proposals of members on both sides of the aisle have come forward and considered. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wonder. Mr. Frost. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we 
had some crocodile tears by the uh, part of the two gentlemen from Florida about the absence of uh, additional federal judges, I would point out that Senator Hatch, the rank, the chairman of the Judiciary Committee, Republican member in the Senate, has refused to hold hearings on any pending federal judicial nomination this calendar year by the President of the United States. There are a number of federal judicial nominees pending in the Senate, and he has adamantly refused to even hold hearings. And that's one of the reasons why we are short-staffed in our federal well, bench Well, the gentleman right yield now. on that. Yes. Uh, I certainly am sympathetic to your concerns. I do not know what Mr. Hatch's, Senator Hatch's perspective is on this, but I know that I have urged him very strongly to hold those hearings and to get along with the judges where we do have nominees, including one uh, for the appellate court uh, recently nominated from, uh, from our state. Yes, it's, it's an it is, in fact, an unfortunate situation because there are a number of highly qualified people who have been nominated by the president, and Senator Hatch has not held hearings on any of these individuals. Uh, gentlemen, yeah. uh, please refer to them as alligator tears anyway. We don't have crocodiles in Florida. The, uh, the, uh, the point I want to make is that we've worked very closely with the senators from Florida as well, and we have, as far as I know, uh, not only good support but great initiative being taken. Last year, the House passed this measure and provided for it. It was not able to get through the Senate, as the gentleman has properly pointed out. The senators are aboard, and we are doing our darndest. Uh, I'm not sure that everybody in the country agrees with us entirely, but those of us who understand the need clearly know this is a completely legitimate request. Uh, I'm not talking about the creation of, of new judgeships. I'm talking about the nominations for 34 existing judgeships that have been uh, sidetracked in the Senate because Senator Hatch will not hold hearings on any of those individuals. Again, I don't know what the rest of the beef is there, but I know there's more to that cow than just what you've told us. The facts of the matter is, as your colleague from Florida has indicated, everyone has urged Senator Hatch to get on with it, and he's refused to do it. Um, the, um, I do have a question here, and maybe Mr. McCollum has a simple answer, but this seems to me like it's the carnival barker with the, the three shells, and I'm trying to figure out which shell the pea is under, sure. and it may be none of the three. Uh, and this has to do with the gun lock provision. Right. Now, if I understood correctly, gun lock provision was originally in 2037. Right. Then part of the gun provisions were broken out of 2037 and put into 21-22, the gun provisions dealing with gun shows but not gun locks. Then you've taken some of the other provisions that were in 2037 and introduced them as your substitute number 60. But that also does not include the, the trigger lock provisions. That's now, correct. what's happened to the trigger lock provisions? Well, the trigger, lock provision, the trigger lock provisions and a number of the other gun-related provisions that were in 2037, I believe and I understand, have been offered by other members as amendments proposed to your committee. I did not personally offer them because I was told that individual members were offering them. But I, certainly yield, I will tell you that Mr. Davis of Virginia has submitted that as an amendment uh, to be considered here. It's one of the 175 that we've received. Mm -hmm. But it is, it is not part of the package of amendments offered by the gentleman from Florida. That's correct. It originally was part of your package of amendments. It was originally part of the bill 2037, but it has not, never been part of an amendment I proposed here in front of the Rules Committee. I understand, but it was part of the original 2037. It, it was, and I would stand by that. And if I might take the opportunity of your bringing it up to make a point of distinction that I overheard in the discussion with Chairman Hyde, there is a huge technical distinction between a device and a part to a gun. Uh, and if you're talking about a device, we're talking about some extraneous device which is specific to a gun in order to allow the owner to disable it. And that is what is de defined that way that Senator Cole of Wisconsin, the Democrat senator Mr. Hyde cited, who originally authored this, uh, conceived, and we in our research have dis determined that that is indeed the appropriate distinct definition and that there is a misperception out there that some people have uh, that somehow this particular proposal would in some way create a greater loophole when in fact it does not. It simply creates a technological ability for somebody who has a new device, which I understand does exist and we've seen, uh, to take a pin uh, and remove it from a gun because it's built in there for this purpose, put it on a keychain or something, and disable the gun from firing. Uh, and under the proposal that came out of the Lautenberg Amendment in the Senate on the safety locks or trigger locks, uh, that device would not have been considered a safety device. And yet it is probably one of the more creative, innovative, simple, and inexpensive provisions you could possibly have to prevent a child from being able to fire a gun or anyone else. Are there other gun provisions that were originally part of 2037 
which are no, now not a part of 2122-22 20, uh, and not a part of your uh, amendment number six, Juvenile. Yes, there are. The Juvenile Brady provision that's so, so referred, which I strongly support, and that involves going back and saying if a young... And who's offering that? I, I don't know. They, the staff up there probably do, but I know there are several. All of these My California here. colleague, Mr. Rogan, has offered that Mr. amendment Rogan. to us. Okay. Uh, there are a couple more of them. Uh, I'm looking down here to try to see where it is. But there are several. There are two or three more of them that relate to this matter. The assault, assault weapon, the the, position, the uh, provision dealing with children being able to uh, possess an assault weapon, and I understand that's being separately offered. Uh, can, can you tell us who is offering that? I, I don't know, but uh, it's a bipartisan staff. amendment. Democrat and Republican have both offered that. And there's an, a parental responsibility amendment dealing with liability, criminal liability for certain aspects of leaving a gun near a, a, the side somewhere. And that's, I understand that's it. That's all of them. So if I understand correctly, and these provisions will be offered to 1501. They will not be offered to 2122. Is that correct? Well, and I believe this is entirely up to your committee. And, and whether they're offered or whether they're allowed to either of these bills would be up to the Rules Committee. That's my understanding. I have not proposed any of them as amendments, uh, believing that others would do so. But since they were originally part of a package that you were proposing, do you have any preference as to where they should be offered? I don't have any distinct preference, but it strikes me that it would probably be appropriate to follow the suggestion, if 2122 is made as a base bill, mm -hmm. uh, to have it as the, as the one to which those amendments are offered. But I have no personal preference at all. So that, that you would then group all of the gun provisions and have them all offered to 2122? Well, it would make a more, if Mr. Frost, it would make a more consistent debate to, to cluster them there if you're going to do it that way, if we're going to have two separate bills, so that the focus on the gun issues directly uh, that are so emotional at this point can be dealt with in a logical fashion. But uh, you could do it either way. The bottom line is we need to have a debate on them. And I certainly think we need to close loopholes when it comes to juveniles and, and their possession or ability to possess guns. Mr. Chairman, is that the current intention of the committee that all the, the various gun provisions would then be offered as, an, as amendments to 2122? As I went through, I, I don't know if you were here when I went through the litany of those items that we are looking and, and that I'm hoping that will be options that members will consider and so they would be to HR 2122. Yeah. None of them would be offered to, uh, to 1501. I don't think so at this point. Okay. Um, I have no other questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Sessions. I have no questions. Thank you. Mrs. Slaughter. Thank you very much, Bill. Let me Thank just, uh, our, our next witness is uh, the gentleman from Massachusetts, uh, Mr. Frank. Let me just say as, as uh, we move to Mr. Frank that uh, it was in fact on the 26th of May uh, when we were in the midst of the legislative branch appropriations bill that this entire package, uh, which had been authored by Mr. Conyers, which had not gone through the committee, was the proposal that the uh, distinguished ranking member made to the, uh, uh, for consideration for waivers w when we proceeded with that appropriations bill. So I just wanted to say that, that uh, others have uh, tried to move without uh, going ahead with uh, full committee hearings and all. With that, we're happy to uh, recognize the distinguished gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Frank. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We have heard with regard to young people a lot of discussion of the problem of substance abuse, and clearly substance abuse is a serious problem with our young people. But today, they and the rest of us are being subjected to a new problem. It's called procedural abuse. I have never in my 19 years here seen a bill worse handled from the standpoint of trying to allow the democratic process to function. I, I, maybe I should feel a little guilty. I notice some of my colleagues are here. Uh, there used to be, some years ago, a very proud institution here called the Judiciary Committee. It spent a lot of time having uh, meetings on legislation, and there were some very important discussions there. I've learned from people like Mr. Hyde and others as we have debated. Now we have a very large range of very important issues. Uh, I, I counted the First Amendment, the Second Amendment, the Eleventh Amendment about suing states. Uh, everything but the Third Amendment. No one's proposing quartering any troops. But um, we've got a whole lot of the Constitution implicated here, and the Judiciary Committee hasn't been allowed to have any real process on any of it. And I guess I, I, I have to ask the Republican leadership, was it something we said? <laughs> w were we, during, for instance, impeachment, somehow disrespectful? I mean, have we 
somehow made this venerable and formerly respected institution worthless in your eyes? Can we rehabilitate the Judiciary Committee? Is there any posture we can take that would allow you to allow the Judiciary Committee to, to come back again? The confusion is enormous. First of all, and, and Mr. S Mr. Frost suggested that we're, we're talking about the three P's, and he's right. And, and one of the, we started with 1501, which is the wholly bipartisan juvenile justice bill that Mr. Scott and others have worked on. Then we got the, uh, the Senate gun amendments, that one over here. And now we have a new bill, it's called H.R. 2036, which is about a week old, and in a week is gonna be presented on the floor of the House, having gone through no subcommittee markup or committee markup. So we had all three. But then what happened was the Republican leadership didn't like the way that was gonna work politically. So as I understand what happened is 1501 got joined to the, the, the juvenile justice bill got joined to the, to the gun bill, and then the Republicans were gonna put this bill onto that bill, but then they decided to pull the gun bill out. So actually that became a separate bill, and these two became this bill. So if you were confused, that's the explanation. Um, three bills now became two different bills. Uh, I must say the suggestion that all of this is happening uh, without regard to the politics of it is something that I do not think anyone believes. And I think the number of occasions on which we in our business ought to say things that no one believes should be minimized. Um, clearly, uh, the no, Republican leadership, that. minimized, I, I, I'm not a perfectionist. I don't think it can be abolished, but I think we ought to hold it down. Um, uh, it was interesting that some of the more popular provisions of the base bill have now been deleted from the bill so that Republican members can offer them as amendments. That's an interesting uh, thing. I, I assume, I haven't reread the Federal Election Commission. I do not think they have to report the right to offer those amendments as a campaign contribution, but it's clearly within the spirit of the law that they should, should do so. Um, also, we've taken some of the gun stuff and we've left that so we can be free floating, so members who do not want to restrict gun shows further or do any of that stuff can vote no and feel free to vote for the rest of it, so we get rid of that one. Now, we have the substantive problems that occur under 2036. And those are really very disturbing. Uh, I don't think the Constitution, and particularly the Bill of Rights, ought to be considered a zero-sum game. That is, if you're for one of the amendments, you must not be for another one. I understand some of my colleagues have a different view of the Second Amendment than I, and I respect that, and I'm willing to debate it. But must their commitment to the Second Amendment come at the expense of the First Amendment? Uh, one version, that, when 2036 was introduced a week ago, it had a provision that said, starting on page 4, section 2712, any retail establishment engaged in the sale of sound recordings in interstate or foreign commerce shall make available for on-site review the lyrics package with any sound recording. I do not think any more harassing over-regulation of Mr. retail Chairman. Yes? Mr. Chairman, I would like to ask regular order. I believe that people who should come before this committee with the time constraints that we have to discuss those amendments which they wish the committee to take I, under I, uh, consideration. Mr. Frank is addressing it as well as every other member. I think you've given great latitude to every one of them, and I don't see any reason to... Mr. Chairman, uh, he, he is listed as having uh, several amendments which uh, need to be discussed, and Mr. Frank has been up on the podium now for several minutes, and I've never heard him discuss those issues which are before this committee. Thank you. I, I uh, regular order, I Mr. Chairman. Rules say that a member has to confine his remarks to the amendments. I, I would say that it is the spirit of the committee to uh, indeed uh, allow latitude, particularly to members of the Committee of Jurisdiction. Uh, and there is some case that the Committee of Jurisdiction may have been the Judiciary Committee, as the gentleman has pointed Wait. out. However, there are a hundred and some amendments, and I believe the gentleman from Texas has properly pointed out it would be useful if well, we could that, get Mr. to the point of some of the I would just correct amendments. you to say I would be a member of the Committee of Jurisdiction if there were, in fact, a Committee of Jurisdiction in this jurisdiction. But uh, there does not appear to be a Committee of Jurisdiction. Mr. Chairman. I, I, I'm Chairman, sorry. For the, there's I been discussion and testimony given by the chairman of the Judiciary Committee indicating that this body was the, uh, the committee of jurisdiction, so that has already been established during this hearing, sir. In the gentleman we understand where we are. Well, um, I, would, no, I just have to respond. Um, the 2036, for instance, has never been considered by the Judiciary Committee. None of this has been considered by the full committee. The committee has not reported out any legislation, so no, it is not the committee that has been the Committee of Jurisdiction. Um, and I, I do think what I'm saying is relevant because I am making a procedural suggestion, and I will. That is that 2036 in particular 
the part I read about lyrics. Now, I'm told that may be withdrawn. We don't know that yet because there hasn't been a, a hearing. But it also talks about violence, and I'm talking very specifically about the responsibility of this committee. I think it would be a grave error to allow this to get voted on on the floor of the House with no consideration whatsoever by what would have been the Committee of Jurisdiction. We are talking here about very important First Amendment issues. Some of it is perfectly reasonable. We've talked about it before, and we could vote on it. But when we talk about banning some of the things we're banning, there are provisions in here which would appear to be censoring the news. Now, there are things on the news I don't like, often. But the notion that the Congress should vote to censor the news, uh, there's a protection of minors provision, prohibition, whoever knowingly solicits sales loans, et cetera, uh, any visual representation. There's nothing in here that exempts the news. Nothing in here that exempts the newspaper. Mr. Or Chairman, TV I would news. once again ask that the, uh, that the witness have an opportunity to discuss those which are before us, which are frank number 169, which was considered late, establishes a new section three to provide for the caring community of caring program and also I believe what is number 100 for each character education programs in schools to combat school violence. Mr. Chairman, once again, I'd say there is no rule of this committee that makes a member speak specifically on the amendment before. I would before. thank the ranking minority member. I would also point out, and I, I, I will say to the gentleman from Texas, I had underestimated his passion for censorship. I didn't realize it extended no, no, to other no, members I, who were saying I things he didn't like. If, if I'm talking end, about the Rules Committee's business, Mr. Chairman. Now, what I am I, suggesting I, to you is, there is a very important amendment that you're going to be asked to be made in order, and I think it, the notion that it is not relevant for members to suggest that things not be made in order has no basis whatsoever. This is not right. simply a one-sided listing of wishes. Are, I am are you saying testifying you, on behalf of the amendment that you're making, or are you talking about another amendment? I'm, I'm testifying as a member of the Judiciary Committee on several amendments, uh, as is often the case. I do not know, as the chairman said, as a former chairman, any rule that says you talk only about one amendment. And I'm talking about the procedures. I am saying that to put in order legislation, I understand the gentleman from Texas is distressed at my discussing it. If I were going to be asked not, to vote that's on this, not true at all. The is it my time, yield. Mr. Chairman? I, no, I won't yield at this point. The gentleman interrupted me several times without asking me to yield, trying to cut me off. Um, the fact is that the committee is being asked to recommend an amendment, which I believe violates the First Amendment in many cases. Maybe I could be persuaded that it doesn't. It has some purposes with which I sympathize that could perhaps be served if it were refined. But to send this one week after it is introduced, unmonitored by any committee process to the floor of the House, would be a grave error. And I am asking the Rules Committee not to allow the First Amendment so to be uh, trifled with. There were a couple of other amendments. Ms. Waters, in particular, had several amendments that I think are very important that I hope would be made in order involving uh, uh, there's a designation in the bill that a particular private organization be given federal money and then in turn be the one that dispenses that money, the National Center for Neighborhood Enterprise. That's very disturbing to me, and I would hope that the committee would uh, allow at least Ms. Waters' amendment to be in order. Mr. Capuano, my colleague, has a very good amendment on juvenile witness assistance programs, which I hope would be made in order. We've had a problem of witness intimidation recently in uh, in Boston, um, but I want mostly to talk again about these procedures. Uh, I think this is an awful way to deal with very serious issues. These issues deserve more serious consideration, so my specific recommendation is that operating within your rules, do not allow this to go forward this way. We've had a lot of, well, this one said it and that one said it. As far as the Democratic leadership is concerned, I, the Democratic leadership never asks that this whole package of legislation come to the floor without any committee process. Some people did think that the bill should come from the, the, the Senate gun control language should come forward. We in the Judiciary Committee moved to try and take it up in committee. But what you have, once again, are proposals that undercut the First Amendment, undercut vigorous debate, even for good motives, and to send those to the floor unvetted by a committee process really is procedural abuse. Thank you. Uh, with regard to the amendments of Mr. Capuano and... Uh, Ms. Waters. And Ms. Waters, yeah, did, did the committee review those? Has the committee reviewed those amendments? The Judiciary Committee? Yes. Uh, I 
think one has on the National Center for Neighborhood Enterprise because that's simply a motion to strike. The others, no. Unfortunately, the committee hasn't had a chance to. So uh, let me see. My preference would be send the whole thing back to committee and let the committee deal with it. Um, that would I, be your recommendation for the Rules Committee? For, for the whole package of stuff, yes, to let the, uh, the, rule, let, let the mandate that the Judiciary Committee actually function as a committee and vote on these things and send them out. Thank you very much, Mr. Buckley. because of apparently uh, members who were notified aren't here. Uh, Honorable Gerald Nadler, New York, I do not see. The Honorable Robert C. Scott, I did see. I do see. Thank you for being present, Mr. Scott. Your prepared marks will be accepted for the record without objection. Any comments you wish to make on any amendments you have will be very pleasingly accepted. And if you wish to wander a little bit afield to talk about some other things of the jurisdiction of your committee, they will be tolerated to a point. But please understand that there are many other members who also need to testify on these hundred and some amendments. I'll um, just summarize my remarks, Mr. Chairman, um, and my comments are being submitted for the record. Mr. Chairman, approximately 13 children die every year from gun violence. And this process that we're presently engaged in is a complete embarrassment. There have been allegations of politicizing, and obviously any time you deviate from the normal, regular order, that uh, deviation is inherently suspect. And I think it's suspect in this case, particularly after you've had the exchange of uh, us in the middle of a markup without the committee members having the bill, with uh, major procedural decisions being made, with nobody knowing where, who made the decision. If we have a deliberate process, Mr. Chairman, you can come up with reasonable legislation. That's where 1501 came from. We had the bill introduced. We had hearings. We had judges, advocates. And we had researchers testify as to what we needed, and they pointed out that graduated sanctions, something between probation and incarceration, was what judges needed to effectively deal with juvenile crime. And that bill was reported out of a committee unanimously, and now we have a process that is so convoluted that we were required to have amendments submitted last Friday, and here three days later, we're finding out what bill we're actually amending. Uh, that's not a, a reasonable process, and it's in that context that my amendment, I'm not sure exactly what bill may be floating around that it's amending, but it's the um, Hyde McCollum, it started out as a Hyde McCollum bill, and it started out as Title I of that, um, of that legislation. I think it's now Title II. I'll point out that the entire bill skipped through subcommittee and committee. Uh, the chairman of the subcommittee, Mr. McCollum, has drafted the bill. He did not present that, and, and there was an exchange. He did not present that to subcommittee for any consideration. And there's a reason for that, Mr. Chairman, because it has provisions like uh, trying more juveniles as adults that could not have made it through the subcommittee or committee process. We know that if you try more juveniles as adults, we know that there is a leniency gap. The children affected will probably be treated more leniently in adult court. We also know that because the judge is restricted to incarceration with, with adults or probation, that the crime rate will go up. We also know, Mr. Chairman, that the uh, juvenile will be endangered, more likely to be assaulted, more likely to commit suicide. That's why those provisions can't go through a normal legislative process, because you can't produce a witness that can credibly testify in favor of it. Of all the witnesses we heard, only one testified in favor of this provision, and he acknowledged that he was totally unaware of research in his own department which trashed this particular provision. No one else had anything good to say about it, and everybody else said that the studies, if you do all, any of the research, that you know that the crime rate will go up if you try more juveniles as adults. And that's why this whole process is, 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 is a sham. There's another provision. You're federalizing more, more uh, juvenile crimes. 
just refer, refer you to the remarks that the Chief Justice has made about uh, federalizing crimes. We don't need it. The, the federal courts do not have juvenile judges. They do not have juvenile facilities. And it makes no sense to try more juveniles in the federal courts. Uh, if we had a deliberative process, we would know that these provisions didn't make any sense. And that's why uh, we have the situation we're in. Mr. Uh, Hyde began his testimony by saying that people were misrepresenting what was in his bills. Well, of course they're misrepresenting. They weren't introduced until late. No one has had an opportunity to have hearings. No one has had an opportunity for a subcommittee or committee consideration. If we had had a deliberate process, we could have scrutinized the, uh, the, 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 the provisions so that we'd know what's in the bills. Uh, Ms. Slaughter suggested um, an amendment of after-school programs. Uh, that, um, uh, frankly, if we had had opportunity to consider bills in committee, uh, that would really be more appropriate for H.R. 15, uh, excuse me, 1150, which uh, was reported out of the subcommittee in the Education Committee. And they didn't have time to uh, commit or have a full committee report, and that's floating around as one of the uh, particular amendments. Mr. Chairman, if this committee this committee should not participate in this charade. What in, I, I would follow the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Frank's suggestion, that you refer all of this back to committee so that we can have a deliberate process and not a partisan charade where we're slinging slogans back and forth at each other, pretending to be doing something about crime. Thank you very much. Do you have anything particular on any amendments? The um, one amendment that I had would uh, strike, I think it's going to be Title II. I'll need the opportunity to uh, figure out which um, bill that you're actually going to consider so it can be refashioned. Basically, it strikes um, the provisions, tr uh, trying more juveniles as adults, which everybody knows will increase the crime rate okay. if you'd have a hearing, and federalizing crimes. There are other amendments pending that would strike other parts of, uh, of that legislation. But you, you really need to go through a process to know what you're doing. Thank you, Mr. Oakley. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank you. Scott. Uh, I say that we've did, uh, Mr. Hutchinson, we'll take your testimony. I'm trying to maintain the uh, back and forth across the aisle here as best I can with the list I'm working with. Mr. Hutchinson, we would be very happy to accept your prepared remarks for the record without objection and welcome any comments you would have on your amendments or any other aspects of this bill, remembering how many members there are yet to testify. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Ranking Member, and members of the committee. Uh, I wanted to uh, present two amendments to you today. The first amendment uh, makes it unlawful to transfer any firearm to a juvenile if the transferor knows or has reason to believe the firearm will be used in a school zone or in the commission of a serious uh, violent felony. Under the current law, even if the transferor knows the juvenile intends to use the weapon to commit a crime, the prohibition only covers handguns and handgun ammunition. H.R. 2037 proposes to expand the prohibition to semi-automatic assault weapons and large capacity ammunition feeding devices. However, under the proposed legislation, uh, it is not against the law to transfer a rifle or a shotgun to, or any other type of weapon to a juvenile, even when the transfer knows that the weapon will be used to commit a serious violent felony or to be used in a school zone. And so the amendment that I'm offering closes this loophole and actually does something positive to keep guns out of the hands of violent juveniles. We're all trying to address the circumstances uh, of Columbine High School, other instances of violent juvenile crime. This really goes to the heart of that, which are the uh, straw purchasers, individuals who will purchase a weapon, transfer it to a juvenile, knowing that it's going to be unlawfully used, and this closes that gap. Uh, the penalties for violating the provision are the same as that would be found under current law or as amended in the existing law. And so if the penalties are enhanced, then that would be triggered to include uh, all firearms. Uh, so I would certainly ask the Rules Committee support for that amendment being offered on the floor. The second amendment adds a new category of permissive uses for grant money authorized under the Juvenile Accountability Block Grants provided in H.R. 1501. This new authority will allow states and localities to use the funds to implement restorative justice programs. And restorative justice is a concept that incorporates community, the victim, and the offender in restitution and a rehabilitative process. 
programs in existence today include local community reparations boards, offender restitution programs, and victor offender mediation. Uh, this was included in the Senate passed bill, but it failed to define what was a restorative justice program. So my amendment uh, would mirror the Senate provision, but also be a little bit more clear. It's better language, it's definitive language for restorative justice, and it really emphasizes the moral accountability of an offender toward the victim and the affected community. And so I'd ask for your support for this amendment as well. And finally, I just want to say a, a word of support for an amendment being offered by the gentleman from, from Missouri, Mr. Talent. I'm co-sponsoring this amendment, which basically says that even uh, whether if you're a youth and you bring a gun to school, you can be uh, disciplined, you can be kicked out of school uh, if you're carrying a gun, whether you're disabled or whether you're not. It would be treating everyone equally. Uh, this was included in the Senate language, and I think it's a very appropriate amendment to be included in the House uh, bill as well. And so with that, I'd be happy to yield any uh, questions. Mr. Linder. Mrs. Slaughter. I'm sorry, I'm calling Wendy. Mr. Sessions. Very much. Thank, Thank you very much, Mr. Hutchinson. And uh, our next witness is uh, my California colleague, Ms. Lofgren. And we're happy to have you, and you're welcome to provide a summary. And uh, whatever prepared you mark, marks you have will appear in their entirety in the record. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I. Um want to join some of my colleagues who have suggested that this process leaves much to be desired by way of dealing with the issue. And I just want to briefly comment, because I think there's been some confusion, about uh, the efforts made to get a timely uh, action on uh, the gun provisions. In the Judiciary Committee, I suggested, along with a number of other members, that we take the bill 1501, the bipartisan bill described by Chairman McCollum, and also uh, bring forward the Senate gun amendments passed before the recess because they had been thoroughly debated, and just deal with those two things. Um, uh, instead, um, the chairman uh, suggested that we have a markup. Uh, and uh, we are prepared to do that as well. And now we have neither. We have neither the markup nor the very simple uh, procedures that we had hoped for. And what I fear and really what I, I observe here is uh, a, a situation unfolding that maximizes the possibilities that provisions relating to guns uh, will be defeated. We had a bill, 1501, that had bipartisan support. It took a lot of work on the part of Chairman McCollum and Ranking Member Scott to come to agreement. I'm a co-sponsor of the bill as well. That could pass this House. Instead, however, I learned today that the poison pill provisions that cannot get wide support will be offered and likely adopted, ensuring that that bill is now in trouble. Uh, we also have the the only provision in the Senate that was nearly it was tied, the gun show provision. The vice president had to had to break that tie. That's the standalone gun measure. So we've taken the least popular gun measure as the underlying vehicle for guns, which maximizes the opportunity for entire defeat. And I just must say that I'm very concerned that what could be simple, what the public wants us to do, instead is going to get. Uh, lost in um, in partisanship, and I think that that is a shame. And I think it's it's even yet possible to avoid that outcome. I have an amendment uh, that I learned only today when I was able to get a copy of Chairman Hyde's amendment is almost the same as his, uh, relating to um, the importation of large clips. It is. Uh, co-sponsored by my uh, Congressman Meehan and uh, uh, Congresswoman DeGette. We have worked very closely uh, with Senator Feinstein's office so that it completely matches what the Senate approves. And to that extent, I would recommend this amendment over Mr. Hyde's amendment because it is precisely what the Senate has already approved and therefore is likelier to become law. Uh, perhaps Mr. Hyde and I will have an opportunity to discuss this. I would uh, be uh, eager to join with him. Uh, in co-sponsoring the bill, and I, I'm sure that um, Mr. Meehan and 
uh, Ms. Deget would join with that. And with that, uh, since you have many, many more witnesses to come, I will cease my discussion. Well, thank you very much, Ms. Lofgren. And uh, since you've raised the issue uh, again at the outset, I, I feel compelled to once again talk about the May 20th meeting um, at which uh, a desire was made on the part of the Democratic leadership to expedite this process as quickly as possible. That week, we in fact, when we were proceeding on the six days later, on the 26th of May, with consideration in this committee of the Legislative Branch Appropriations Bill, the entire package, which appears to be, I don't have it in front of me right here, I had it just a moment ago, of about uh, 25 or 30 pages uh, that had been authored by uh, Mr. Conyers was offered as a substitute requesting the waivers by the ranking member of this committee. And so a desire to move ahead very quickly was set forth then, and we have obviously held hearings uh, in the Judiciary Committee. I went through that list earlier. On the 26th of May, there were hearings. And then uh, on another date, the Subcommittee on Crime uh, chaired by Mr. McCollum and Mr. Scott as the ranking member, as you pointed out, uh, held hearings addressing this. So I think that it's um, a, a bit of, uh, I, I just think it's important for us to explain it. I'm very sorry that this is bogged down into a partisan battle uh, myself, but I, I just think that it's important for the record to state that, that uh, the Democratic leadership wanted us to move as quickly as possible, and we have tried to do just that, and it's taken about two weeks rather than two days. Dave, but we've Dave tried I don't that. know if you have it. I would like to submit for you and for the record Chairman Hyde's letter uh, to Mr. Conyers that followed that meeting. I was, of course, not present, being too unsenior to attend, mm -hmm. but I would like to make that that. Well, I, uh, I think it's already included as part, part of the, the record. record. And, and just note that uh, whatever we say in the end, the country's going to look at how this has been set up, and if right. it doesn't work, but uh, we're, they we're will hoping know very how much, to As I said, we're hoping to have every uh, provision addressed, and I'm, I'm hoping that we'll be able to do that at the end of the day. Mr. Linder, Mr. Frost, and Mrs. Okay. Slutter. Thank you very much. We appreciate your being here. Now, I'm sorry. Right. And uh, now we're happy to call our uh, colleague from uh, Georgia, Mr. Barr. Hope you got my message that I returned your call. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Did you get my message? Yes, I did, Mr. Okay. Chairman. Okay, good. I just wanted to make sure that you knew I returned it. Uh, for, the, for the record, uh, I would expect nothing less. I know the Chairman is very great, diligent about great. that, as are all members of the uh, Rules Committee. Thank you very much, and uh, you're welcome to provide a, a summary, and any prepared remarks you have will appear in their entirety in the record. I appreciate that, Mr. Chairman, and, and we'll, uh, we'll submit that. Uh, at the risk of doing uh, rather severe damage to uh, both of our reputations, I would like to associate myself with at least some of the remarks, or at least the principles behind the remarks of uh, Mr. Frank, who testified uh, just a short while ago. The issues that bring us uh, here today and that will occupy the time of the entire House on the floor later this week uh, are a very far, far-reaching consequence. And uh, I think we, are, we have now a, uh, almost a unique uh, opportunity in American history where the attention of the public is focused on the issues that we're talking about here that are fundamental to the order of a, of a, of a just society, uh, and that is the problem of, uh, of the taking of lives, of the education of our children, the sanctity of the family, uh, the basic uh, structure of our society really is at stake here. Uh, and I do think that what we ought to do, even, Mr. Chairman, if we don't delay the action on the floor this week, uh, to uh, take a much more comprehensive, much better focused, uh, long-term uh, look at this problem in all of its ramifications. Uh, and specifically, Mr. Chairman, would urge the committee to make an order one amendment that I have proposed, uh, which is to uh, provide for the establishment of a select committee on youth violence. Uh, in my view, Mr. Chairman, the threats to our nation, which were posed by the espionage problems involving communist China, which gave rise, which were deemed of sufficient importance uh, and gravity to give rise to the formation of the select committee chaired by your colleague from California, Mr. Cox, uh, are no less severe when we look at the domestic damage to our society, and therefore I think we clearly ought to establish uh, a, a select committee on youth violence, uh, not to uh, look at these problems in perpetuity, uh, but uh, with a mandate to report back to this body uh, by the end of this session, uh, taking a comprehensive look at all of these, uh, all of the ramifications of this problem. Uh, I would also, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, urge that uh, one other amendment uh, that I have proposed uh, at, the, at the outset uh, be considered and made in order. Uh, there are two versions of it that this committee has before it. Basically, uh, Mr. Chairman, I have taken the McCullum bill, which has the prosecutorial uh, provisions in it, 
uh, and removed from them the gun control provisions. Uh, I have done that two ways. One is a standalone amendment taking the, the McCollum bill uh, 2037, I believe it is, or maybe 2036, but the McCollum bill removed from it uh, the gun control provisions, leaving the rest of it intact, having, having made no changes to it. I believe the prosecutorial provisions in Mr. McCollum's bill, bill are very sound and well thought out. I have also, Mr. Chairman, submitted an amendment in the nature of a substitute, which, substitute, which includes uh, the Hyde bill in addition to H.R. 1501 plus McCollum, uh, leaving all of those intact, save for removing from the McCollum uh, bill, again, those gun control measures. And I, I uh, would appreciate uh, either of those, uh, depending on which permutation fits with the overall work of the Rules Committee on this, be made in order to give those of us who uh, are reflective of the will of the American people, as I have heard and as members have been hearing over the last several weeks since the tragedy in Littleton especially, and that is that this is not a problem of crime control. Uh, this is a problem uh, going deep into the roots of our culture, our society, and is uh, clearly a problem of culture, not gun control. It is also, Mr. Chairman, as uh, I think everybody here would agree, to one extent or another, a problem of crime control. And therefore, I think that at least insofar as we are moving forward with a, a relatively quick reaction or quick fix here, that we ought uh, not to be drawn off track into that siren song of gun control and look instead, Mr. Chairman, at least in this initial stage, uh, at the fundamental issues involving uh, the prosecution of crime uh, and doing something tangible to protecting our children. And I think the provisions that Mr. Hyde has submitted, the provisions in H.R. 1501, and the prosecutorial provisions in Mr. McCollum's bill uh, move us in that direction. Uh, but I would, uh, would request that for those uh, of us, primarily conservatives on both sides of the aisle, uh, who believe that that should be the proper focus, prosecution of our criminal laws, not prosecution of law-abiding citizens through gun control, have the opportunity to vote up or down on a prosecution-oriented piece of legislation that does precisely that. Uh, I have uh, two additional amendments, uh, at least uh, one of which has already been touched on that I think has been submitted, uh, maybe not in identical form, but very similar to the form that I have submitted, Mr. Chairman, and that is on the IDEA proposal. Uh, I submitted, uh, introduced earlier this year, a standalone bill uh, that would simply uh, uh, treat those students, any student who brings a gun to a school, uh, equally. Uh, it levels the playing field. It would not provide, as the current IDEA legislate law provides, that ties the hands of local officials, makes it much more difficult, if not impossible, for them to deal with a student who brings a gun to school and claims, by some strange interpretation of the IDEA, uh, law and regulations that the bringing of the gun to the school is a manifestation of a disability and therefore they can't be reprimanded or treated properly for that. The uh, amendment that I have proposed, similar to the legislation that I have proposed earlier this year as a standalone bill, would simply treat uh, all students who bring firearms to school equally and untie the hands of our local officials to deal with those problems the way that reflects the best interest and the safety of their students, their administrators, and their teachers. Uh, finally, Mr. Chairman, I have uh, submitted another amendment that I believe also uh, may have been submitted by some other members of this great body, and that is to allow the display of the Ten Commandments uh, in our schools. The uh, amendment that I have proposed does not mandate anything. It simply says, I believe, very consistent with the history uh, of the, uh, the First Amendment, the history of our Constitution, that it should not operate and was not intended to operate as a ban on the display of non-sectarian moral philosophy as codified, for example, Mr. Chairman, in the Ten Commandments. Uh, so my legislation, the amendment that I proposed in this area, would simply remove that as a reason, that is, the Constitution as a reason for those who do not favor the posting of, of ethical and moral principles in schools such as uh, the, uh, in the Ten Commandments, uh, that they would not be able to rely on the Constitution to do so, to remove it. It doesn't mandate it. It simply says you can do it consistent with the Constitution. Uh, and uh, I will uh, submit uh, my complete remarks uh, and uh, submit myself to any questions that the chairman of the panel might have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, members of the committee. Now we're uh, very pleased to... Uh so you recognize the gentlewoman from Texas, Ms. Jackson Lee, and we're happy to have you before the committee. And uh, again, we would welcome a summary of uh, your statement. Any prepared remarks you have will appear in their entirety in the record.
Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. First of all, let me thank uh, the Rules Committee for its generosity. I know this is an enormous task. Uh, let me associate, though I've heard the Chairman's explanation, uh, with uh, some of the remarks my colleagues have made. I am not only a member of the Judiciary Committee, but a member of the Crime Subcommittee, of which Mr. McCollum chairs and Mr. Scott is ranking member. The only clarification I wish to offer, I know there has been a lot of debate about the procedural journey that these uh, particular uh, amendments and stand-along bills would take. I just want to, for the record, Mr. Chairman, note that as we left for the memorial work recess, uh, there was um, a, an understanding, even though some of us may have disagreed, uh, that when we returned, the Judiciary Committee would mark up, as of last Tuesday or Wednesday, several of these uh, uh, legislative initiatives, including some dealing with gun legislation. And I note that in the days that follow, things have changed. And I think maybe some of the comments made by my colleagues were drawn to that representation uh, after we uh, uh, as we left for the recess, that the decision or the requirement or the request, rather, to uh, move to the floor directly had been rejected and that we would go to the Judiciary Committee. Um, this is an important issue, and I would hope uh, several things would occur, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, I'd like to associate myself with the remarks uh, made by uh, Ranking Member Mokley and Mr. Gephardt at the beginning, Mr. Gephardt having gone to Columbine and visited with the parents uh, I would hope that what we would say to the American public today is that those young lives uh, were not lost in vain. And I would simply like to say, Mr. Chairman, coming from an urban district, and I think you have heard this because you come from California, those of us in big states know this, that throughout the years we've lost many inner city youngsters to gun violence, and those mothers and fathers are crying out for us to do something as well. Um, with that in mind, I will uh, go through uh, my amendments as quickly as I can. Uh, adding uh, my applause and my desire to see H.R. 1501, uh, authored by Mr. McCullum and Mr. Scott, of which I am an original co-sponsor, uh, took great pains for all of us to come together on a, on a uh, bill dealing with juvenile justice or juvenile crime. One of the things that I think stands out in that bill is that it adheres to many studies, one by the RAND uh, organization, that says that prevention works. Uh, that we know we have a lot of violent circumstances going on with our young people. They're inundated by so many stimuli, but prevention does work. And I would ask that H.R. 1501 uh, stand alone, or, or if uh, in the wisdom of this committee we go back to the Judiciary Committee, we at least get out 1501 as a viable bill dealing with juvenile crime and rehabilitation. I would also ask, um, without pointing the finger, I heard my chairman, Mr. Hyde, who I have a great deal of respect for, as well as Mr. Conyers, Mr. Hyde said that he hopes that his amendment dealing with the entertainment industry uh, is allowed uh, a full hearing. Uh, though I may agree or disagree, I agree with him. He noted that the entertainment industry has a lot of money. I would also follow that up and say, please allow us to have full discussions on some of the more controversial gun provisions, even though the National Rifle Association has a lot of money. And I think we'll do well by the American people if we would follow suit on that. And with that, Mr. Chairman, let me offer to you or suggest to you the amendments that I have. Um, Mr. And let me also ask for a waiver or a, a, an assistance. We left here last week with the understanding to amend H.R. 1501. We now understand with the notice of 2122 uh, that there may be a, a different vehicle by which our amendment should go. I ask for the indulgence of the Rules Committee uh, to not rule us out of order. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I would then like to offer, um, going in the order, uh, somewhat in the order uh, that I, I have them here, is my amendment to uh, allow for additional hiring of ATF officers uh, and indicate uh, to the Chairman uh, that um, we have found in local jurisdictions, I know we have uh, had some ups and downs with that agency, they only have 1,800 ATF officers. I notice in the 2037 bill, which I assume is not in anymore, uh, there was $40 million to, allotted for the hiring or the placement of prosecutors and ATF officers. I would like my amendment to be accepted as a clarifying amendment, in which I will clarify here in front of the Rules Committee. It was to be 200 per five-year period, so 1,000 over five-year period. And I will ask the Chairman to allow Ledge Council indicate they misunderstood us. They have it as 200 for a total five-year period. We'll clarify the funding. But the key element of this is to clarify I guess it's 2122 now, that the lump 
provision that may be in 2122 that was in 2037 speaks in a lump manner to prosecutors and ATF officers. Mine speaks to the need of ATF officers in as much as local officers, local law enforcement has applauded the work that ATF has done in cooperation with them. I don't view them as uh, thugs. I don't view them as people who are outside of the law. Uh, these are hardworking men and women. Let me cite to you, and I will offer to put into the record, I will not uh, recite all of these, uh, the work that they did in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, uh, where a retired security officer for the U.S. Army purchased a handgun, 380 caliber semi-automatic, which was recovered from a 17-year-old member of a Latin, gang, Latin Kings gang in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, straw purchase and sale to drug traffickers. Uh, they discovered AK-47s, which were ultimately used in drug trafficking. In New York City, illegal resale and possession by juveniles. They made a case against that as well. It goes on and on. And I would ask uh, that the committee seriously consider my amendment uh, that would go to the idea of increased uh, ATF officers. Uh, then, Mr. Chairman, I ask for support of my amendment uh, that I hope you will allow a vigorous uh, discussion on the floor of the House on June 19th and 20th in Houston, Texas. We'll have another gun show. Uh, these are held at conventions. Uh, they're huge. They're well attended. And I ask simply that uh, we have an amendment that restricts juveniles for entering gun shows uh, as uh, uh, without an adult. Uh, a, a simple process that I think goes a long way to the responsibility that America's parents are asking for. No less restrictive than what we say about rated movies. Our rated movies. Uh, young people are not supposed to be in there without, if an adult takes them in, we assume it's an adult who has the responsibility for that child and can take them in. Uh, it is well known that the statement we want to make is that children do not need to be around guns unsupervised. So many of the amendments speak to that issue, and I would hope uh, that we would be able to do that uh, and do that with that amendment. So I'd ask the committee support on that. In support of that amendment, Mr. Chairman, let me just simply cite to you a state that uh, is not usually viewed as a state that has gun safety regulations. This is a state law in the state of Texas that has been in place since 1995. I authored it as a city council member, became a state law, which is holding parents or adults responsible for children getting guns in their hands and accidental shootings occurring. This was passed in the state of Texas, and through the efforts of many health professionals, including Dr. Joan Shook of the Texas Children's Hospital, they have documented a 50% decrease in accidental shootings because of this legislation. So I think that limiting children by going into gun shows only with their parents, it certainly takes away the stimuli of children going in and seeing guns and thinking that they're supposed to have it. And I would ask uh, the committee's uh, consideration of that legislation. Um, I also have, I'm sure I don't see them here, but I want to offer uh, legislation dealing with the trigger lock and distinguish some of the trigger lock uh, amendments that are before you. This is a Jackson Lee Carson Melinda McDonald uh, uh, amendment. Uh, what it does is it, uh, it expands, if you will, in a organized and uh, non-hysterical and certainly uh, non-punitive manner the idea of trigger locks. It requires standards. None of the other legislative uh, provisions that are amendments have standards. And so this asks the Secretary of Treasury to develop standards for trigger locks, uh, as well as uh, it provides for the opportunity uh, for there to be an educational portion of the Attorney General which would educate communities about gun safety. This is not a repetitive amendment. Uh, I. Uh, note that uh, Ms. Carson and Ms. Melinda McDonald uh, have offered these two pieces of legislation. We'll come to speak to them. But this amendment combines the two very viable aspects of gun safety by ensuring that trigger locks have safety, uh, have, have standards, rather. We viewed trigger locks just a few days ago. Plastic, uh, uh, metal, take apart your gun. There are no standards, and therefore it is confusing to the public what trigger locks are viable and what would be protecting of their children. This amendment is a comprehensive amendment that allows a full debate, a full debate, Mr. Chairman, on the idea of trigger locks and standards, similar to what the Consumer, Produ uh, excuse me, Consumer Product Safety Commission does with toys, car seats, and others. We need standards. And unlike 2122, uh, this has a provision 
that asked the Attorney General to provide monies throughout the nation to educate parents and children uh, on gun safety. And I think this is uh, crucial uh, with respect to gun safety. Let me also indicate that I have a coal amendment, uh, that's number 93, which simply tracks the Senate language and allows three business days, three business days, uh, excuse me, uh, it provides a, provides a secure gun storage or safety device. It does not have standards. That is uh, the amendment that was offered in the Senate. At this time, Mr. Chairman, in the Senate, at this time, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to yield to the Deloro Amendment on that, and so I will not uh, have that as one of mine. Uh, it is one of mine. I am joined in with her on that amendment, but I hope that that amendment will be allowed in that specifically talks about three business days. Uh, I mean, excuse me, I'm on another amendment. that talks about gun storage or safety, but it does not have standards, but it does follow the Senate language, um, and I think is an amendment that is worth considering. I'll close. Uh, Mr. Chairman, by also uh, indicating to you that I'm very gratified that you all have consented because of uh, sort of uh, interlocking bills. Now we know we're at 2122, uh, and, and therefore uh, there may be some confusion with some of our amendments because we were amending H.R. 1501. Going back to what Chairman Hyde said, uh, and as well uh, Ranking Member Conyers, when they conceded to the fact that many issues impact our children as it relates to uh, violent uh, behavior, uh, whether it's a faith-based uh, community that needs to be involved, whether it's uh, dealing with the entertainment industry. And one of the things that I think is extremely important uh, is the idea of providing them uh, with uh, mental health counselors uh, and access to mental health services. H.R. 1501 took my language in committee, and I have an amendment that will uh, specifically add school nurses school counselors uh, and or mental health professionals to schools uh, with at least 400 students. And that addresses the other aspect of what we're all saying here. Are we listening to children? Do they have someone that they can go to if they feel that they are being teased or that they've seen somebody with a gun, somebody other than a police officer? Is there someone in the school that would take that information safely, protect them from harassment, if you will, or being teased or being threatened? And I believe that is a key element uh, to what we're trying to do here today. So I would hope that this amendment uh, dealing with the mental health needs of our children, a full comprehensive uh, amendment that talks about giving a kid a chance, will also uh, be made in order. With that, Mr. Chairman, I believe I have covered uh, the amendments that are offered. And I'll close by asking that this committee, in its uh, wisdom, allow us a vigorous discussion on these very important issues. We hope to do that. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Ross, any questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Waters, please join us. Thank you. Well, Mr. Chairman, let me just uh, express my sympathy to all of you for the long hours you have to put Thank in. You. Um, it's just beginning. Huh? We're just beginning. Well, in doing that, I also would like to register my uh, concerns about the manner uh, that this is being done. Uh, I'm very disappointed that the uh, Judiciary Committee... You do this very quickly by just associating yourself with the remarks of virtually every other Democrat who's come through here. Um, please, if I may, just um, seriously identify my, my concerns about the Judiciary Committee. Uh, that is the committee uh, that has the responsibility uh, for hearing and marking up uh, this tremendous legislation to have that bypassed. Uh, not only is extremely disappointing to so many of us, but I think it really does undermine the system and does not allow for the debate uh, that I think the people of this country expects from us uh, when we're dealing with issues of this magnitude. So it was just very important for me to say that. And of course, you are burdened with having to hear from all of us who serve on that Judiciary Committee because we feel that we're missing our opportunity to do the work that we're elected to do uh, when this kind of process takes place and we're bypassed. So with that, let me add my voice uh, to those who have come before you today who have registered their uh, complaints and concerns about the Judiciary Committee uh, not uh, having the opportunity uh, to do its work. Uh, having said that, 
I have amendments that basically fall within two categories. And I'm not sure at this point what's going to take place. Uh, when I left here um, and went home, we were going to, I heard that, of course, the Judiciary Committee was going to be bypassed and that the gun amendments, uh, essentially those that had been taken up on the Senate side, were going to be taken up um, on a juvenile justice bill that essentially was a new bill and certainly different from the bill that the Judiciary Committee had worked on. It is rare uh, to have a bipartisan product that comes out of the Judiciary Committee in the way this bill had done. I think it was uh, 15, 1501. And what you had was tremendous work from both sides of the aisle and a consensus about what we need to do to strengthen our laws uh, as it relates to juvenile justice. Now, I suppose that's been put aside. That's what I heard uh, when I left here. And we were going to mark up something that was quite different than the work that had been done. So not only um, have we bypassed the Judiciary Committee, but it appears that we have created, in the absence of a markup, uh, a new bill or bills, and that um, the gun amendments are going to go on to this new piece of legislation. Now, perhaps I'm a little bit behind the newest information, but that's what happens when we are not proceeding in an orderly process. So my amendments, uh, basically, are amendments to deal with juvenile justice, uh, and secondly, a set of amendments to deal with gun safety. On the juvenile justice issues, I am terribly disappointed at what was in the substitute bill uh, that may have been put together, despite the fact we had a consensus bill. This bill, I understand, creates more mandatory minimum sentencing. I am so disappointed that the members of this Congress, in face of everything that we have been confronted with, would simply take the easy way out and create more mandatory minimum sentencing to simply fill up our prisons and have a disproportionate amount of the taxpayers' dollars warehousing uh, a bunch of young people with no real rehabilitation going on in our prisons, but simply more and more people being locked up. It doesn't solve anything. Everything that we see shows that we have not curbed any uh, juvenile justice crimes by having these mandatory minimum sentencing. All that we're doing, again, is raping uh, our revenues and uh, basically uh, warehousing. So I'm disappointed, and one of my amendments would go directly to that. This amendment would strike the mandatory minimum provisions contained in H.R. I guess 2037 and strike the so-called two strikes in your out language and the anti-probationary language in the bill to restore judicial discretion in the sentencing of juvenile offenses. And I think this is extremely important. I join with uh, Justices uh, Beyer, Rehnquist, and Kennedy, who have just outraged about these mandatory minimum sentencing that takes away judicial discretion. Uh, they see it as simply an act by members of Congress to look good and look as if they're tough on crime, when in fact it's really a, a quite a, a dishonest way of handling uh, what confronts us in the juvenile justice uh, system. Third, uh, secondly, let me go to um, the other amendments. I know that a lot of focus are on the gun laws. And let me just say, I am attempting to uh, get some of, some of the laws that we have adopted in the state of California into federal law. One of my amendments would require that persons sponsoring a gun show be registered with the secretary and requires that minors at licensed gun shows be accompanied by a parent or guardian. I can't see any reason why anybody can hold a gun show, sell guns. I know we're talking about the background checks, but I'm talking about knowing who these individuals are that's selling the guns and requiring them to be licensed so that we can find out uh, exactly who's doing the selling, and there's no reason why minors should be able to go to uh, gun shows uh, without being accompanied by their parents, so that's one. Uh, another amendment would require that licensed dealers post lock container notices at their place of business and provide individuals uh, to individuals pur purchasing firearms a written notice of proper safe storage. In my amendments, I, I define what 
a locked storage cabinet is. We'll have people who will come to us and they have a glass cabinet and they say, well, I lock them up. Well, you can break it very easily. These young people are not buying the guns. They're getting them from home. They're getting them from their neighbors. They're getting them right in the community. And in California, we describe and define what a locked storage cabinet is. So in addition to that, I'm also requiring that we post the notices so that those selling the guns can make people aware who are buying the guns of the fact that they have to have storage cabinets that meet uh, the, the, re the required law. Also, um, I have another amendment that would uh, take out from the bill this uh, little attempt to show some favoritism uh, to someone who is requiring some additional funds uh, to deal with young people and gangs. We have laws and we have programs already in place. In the Department of Labor, uh, we have a tremendous program that's dealing with these issues, that's funding people on a competitive basis. I'm warning all of the members of Congress, because I don't want anybody to get caught with this little uh, attempt uh, to show favoritism and literally to slide some money to Mr. Bob Woodson, who just happens to be a certain kind of mouthpiece that people might agree with, uh, and give him some money, even though he's criticized government for spending money on these kinds of issues. If this goes through, what you will have is a duplication of efforts. You will have uh, money that's given in a non-competitive way. You'll have money given to programs that are untested, un un untried, and have no track record. And it's going to end up hurting everyone in the final analysis. But the fact that I'm placing it on the record, I'm warning people that this is an attempt to give some money to a group in a very political way without it being competitive and without uh, and creating duplication in the process. Everybody is fairly warned that this is in this bill and it should not slip through unnoticed. Uh, with that, I think that basically covers um, uh, the amendments that I have. And I would ask, number one, that if there's anything that can be done to put all of this back into the Judiciary Committee, we should stop at this point and not try to railroad um, this bill through trying to do uh, juvenile justice and gun safety in the manner in which it was being done when I left here uh, last Friday. But these two issues certainly should be separated. They should be in the Judiciary Committee and it would give us an opportunity to do the real kind of oversight and debate that's required of us as members of Congress and public policymakers. With that, I thank you for your patience and thank you for uh, indulging me on uh, all that I'm attempting to do on these issues. Thank you for your comments. Uh, Mr. Frost. Uh, Ms. Waters, um, there is a shifting playing field here. Yes. And, um, what's happened is that 2037 doesn't exist anymore. Oh, I see. And that uh, there is now a new bill that Mr. McCollum, a substitute that Mr. McCollum has uh, introduced, uh, taking parts of 2037, and uh, he would attempt to uh, attach those to, uh, uh, to 1501, and specifically as to the mandatory minimums, then you would have to amend his substitute, I assume, if you disagree with the provision in his substitute, so that uh, you would have to ask the committee to make your amendments in order to his substitute. Well, and, then uh, uh, it gets a little complicated. Well, I see what you're saying, and this is uh, shifting as we uh, try and get to the floor, and that's the problem with uh, bypassing the rules of this House to get this kind of thing done. So I would respectfully ask uh, that um, my amendments on mandatory minimums uh, would, um, I would ask for, to waive all points of order uh, and to I guess uh, attach them to that particular legislation, whatever that number is. Now it's, um, it's, this is going to be a very complicated procedure should we, uh, should we ever get to the floor of the House. And uh, I think it's going to be difficult for members to follow. And I think you are exactly correct to point out that this is exactly the reason why this should have been dealt with as a, a matter of uh, original jurisdiction in the Judiciary Committee rather than attempting to do on the floor what should have been done in the, in the Judiciary Committee. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Wexler.
Simcoe. You may submit prepared remarks if you'd like. They'd be accepted in the record without objection, and you may summarize. Thank you very much for your patience, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Frost. Um, I will get directly to the point. The recent shootings at Columbine High School shocked Americans. They are a vulgar comment on the growing violence in our society and the compelling reason why our gun laws need to be reformed. And the country does want reform. In fact, 69% of Americans favor what my amendment will do, which is to limit handgun purchases to one per month. This proposal was endorsed this weekend by the people closest to the problem, the bipartisan United States Conference of Mayors. Imagine if a Columbine incident happened every day. Well, it does. Every day in America, 13 young people are killed by guns. Many more are wounded. I commend my colleagues who are working to close the gun show loophole, ban the importation of high capacity magazines, and mandate the sale of child safety devices. These measures, however, do little to stop the gun running operations that many juveniles and criminals depend upon to obtain numerous handguns. And that's why it's so crucial that this amendment be considered during our debate. We often hear about the black market, that infamous place where anyone with enough cash can get weapons. No one seems to know where the black market is, just that it exists somewhere. Is it in a dark alley, in the middle of the woods? Where is it? The truth is the black market exists in retail stores throughout America. Criminals are getting handguns from gun stores. They don't go into the gun stores themselves. They get someone else to buy the handguns for them. They get a straw purchaser, or more appropriately, a gun runner, someone who has no criminal record and wants fast cash. Gun runners make a living being professional handgun shoppers for criminals and children. The amendment before you mirrors my bill, the Anti-Gun uh, gun Running Act of 1999 which has 100 co-sponsors. The amendment limits people to buying one handgun a month. That's 12 handguns a year. It stops gun runners by taking away their ability to buy handguns in bulk. It does not affect the purchase of rifles or shotguns, just handguns. The juvenile justice bill increases penalties for making a straw purchase. However, most straw purchases are discovered only after a crime has occurred. We can actually stop criminals and juveniles from getting handguns and prevent crimes if Congress passed this amendment. This is not radical new gun restriction. In fact, Virginia, South Carolina, and Maryland already limit the number of handguns a, purchase can buy, a person can buy to one a month. Has it worked to stop crime? You bet. When Virginia let people buy handguns in bulk, 40% of guns seized in New York City in crimes were traced to Virginia. Then Virginia started to limit handgun purchases to one a month. After that, guns traced to Virginia fell 61% for guns recovered in New York, 67% in Massachusetts, and 38% in New Jersey. For the Northeast as a whole, the percentage of guns from Virginia fell by 54%. Let's look at it from a different angle. As we now know, handguns rec recovered in a particular city will often be traced to a person who bought them in an entirely different part of the country. For example, the vast majority of handguns used in crimes in Boston come from outside New England. A 1994 study showed that 31% came from Georgia, 30% from North Carolina, and 24% from Florida. These statistics show that despite what one state may do, another state with lax gun laws can provide criminals and juveniles with the weapons they need to commit crimes. The trafficking of weapons is a national problem, and it must be addressed in federal law. And no, it is not simply a matter of enforcing the laws we already have on the books. For this problem, a federal law does not exist. This amendment does not hamper anyone's ability to protect themselves or their families. The only thing this amendment will do is put a big close for business sign on the handgun black market and make it more difficult for criminal, criminals and juveniles to arm themselves. 
Mr. Chairman, I would respectfully request that this committee make this amendment in order for a vote by the House of Representatives. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. <coughs> You're welcome to be here anytime. Mr. Rockman is next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for this opportunity to appear before you to offer to the, you and to this committee two amendments to the various juvenile justice gun control bills that are before this body. Two amendments. The first one deals with the storage of guns and ammunition at gun stores. The second amendment deals with allowing local school boards to access some of the money in 1501 if they choose to for metal detectors for their schools. The First Amendment, setting safety and security standards for the storage of guns and ammunition at gun stores. Why is that necessary? Unfortunately, in New Jersey, two years ago, there was a tragedy. Two individuals called up for pizza. The pizza was delivered by two young people. And the two callers shot the two pizza delivery men for the thrill of it. The two shooters got their guns from a gun shop that had been closed. They broke into the gun store, smashed the glass, stole the guns and ammunition, and use them in their crime. The gun, neither the guns nor the ammunition at the gun shop were locked up. There was no law that required it, and the gun shop owner didn't do it. Mr. Chairman, we require druggists, pharmacists, to lock up their drugs at night so that junkies and addicts or others can't break into a drugstore, a pharmacy, and steal these drugs and use them for illegal purposes. Why shouldn't we require gun shop owners to lock up their guns and ammunition at night? It doesn't prevent them in any way from selling their guns and ammunition lawfully. It's not really gun control at all. It is gun safety so that the guns and ammunition cannot be stolen. This is not a problem that is simply limited to one isolated incident in northern New Jersey. In 1998, licensed gun dealers reported to the Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms Bureau that over 14,000 guns were stolen, lost, or missing from their gun stores. There's a new game, so we are told, uh, that gang members are playing. It is called Smash and Grab. What they do is they steal a car and drive the car into the front of a gun store, smashing the front of the building, running in, stealing the guns and ammunition, and using them in crime. We can prevent or minimize the success of these smash and gun efforts by simply requiring gun store owners to lock up their guns and ammunition at night or whenever they close their store. That's amendment number one. Amendment number two. The bill 1501 provided one, over $1 billion over a three year period for various uh, uh, programs that might help reduce the incidence of juvenile crime and in particular gun crimes involving juveniles. It did not provide for the purchase or leasing of metal detectors by local school boards. It didn't even give the school boards the option of buying or renting metal detectors for their schools. Now, we all know that there are many culprits, many individuals and entities responsible for violence in schools, gun violence in particular. There was parental neglect teacher neglect, school administrator neglect, the wanton and wrongful behavior of the juveniles themselves who shot and killed the other juveniles, violent, salacious, and sadistic video games 
movies, television programs. There's more than enough blame to go around. But if we can prevent young people from having easy access to guns in school, we will be taking the first step and the largest step, in my opinion, to preventing gun violence in schools. And that is why my second amendment would allow the spending of some of the grant money now available or to be available under 1501 to be used at the local school board's option if they feel that it is a priority for their school district to have gun and metal detectors in their schools. It's not a federal mandate. It would allow school boards to make their own judgment whether they wanted to use this money for that purpose. You know, in 1972, we started as a nation to address hijackings on airplanes in 1972, when the FAA first required weapons checkpoints at airports. It's now over 25 years later, and we have discovered that those metal detectors were successful. In those schools that do have metal detectors, we know that metal detectors in schools have already prevented young people from entering schools with weapons. In Elizabeth, New Jersey, for example, in the high school and middle school, since they were installed four years ago, not one single gun has been brought into the school successfully. The problem is that metal detectors are expensive. Many school districts cannot afford them. They can cost up to $8,000 a piece. Even the handheld metal detectors can cost several hundred dollars a piece. Why not allow local school boards who feel that this is what they wish to do with their money or a portion of the money that they might be entitled to, why not allow them to use some of this grant money for metal detectors? And that is the substance of my second of two amendments. Allow local school boards at their option to use some of this grant money for metal detectors. I thank the committee and the chair for your consideration of both of these amendments. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Rothman. We appreciate the... Uh the work and time that you've put into what obviously is a very, uh, very important issue. Um, Mr. Linder, Mr. Mulkley, Ms. Myron. Oh, I'm sorry. Great. Well, thank, thank you very much. We committee. appreciate your being here. Thank you, Jim Dreyer. Thank you. And uh, our next witness is the gentlewoman from Wisconsin, Ms. Baldwin. And uh, we welcome you to the Rules Committee. And uh, I would say again that uh, any prepared remarks that you have will be included in their entirety in the record and a summary would be welcome. And I'd like to formally inform the uh, members of the committee that uh, since Ms. Baldwin is the last member of the Judiciary Committee, I guess that means you're the most junior member of the Judiciary Committee, to uh, testify we will be uh, taking a break and then reconvene at 6 o'clock for consideration of the year 21 bill. And uh, Mr. Moakley was asking when do we eat and the fact is I guess after Ms. Baldwin's testimony is when we can all uh, get together and don't, have an early don't dinner. Rush. I've eaten already. <laughs> He's eaten already. Okay. Well, thank, thank you, you Mr. very much, Ms. Baldwin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. Um, I have one amendment before you today, and I respectfully ask that you allow my amendment to be made in order and waive any points of order that could be made against it during its consideration. Regrettably, I must call your attention to a drafting error that I discovered and additionally ask that you allow me to, collect, to uh, introduce a corrected copy of my amendment as a substitute to the one that was filed in a timely manner on Friday. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, my amendment would authorize the Attorney General to provide grants to states and localities to establish or maintain families and schools together or the FAST program. A $9 million authorization for FAST was included in the Bipartisan Manager's Amendment to the Senate Juvenile Crime Bill, S-254, in May. What is the FAST program? It is an award-winning prevention program that reconnects troubled youth with their families and schools. But unlike prevention programs that focus only on the troubled young persons, FAST is focused on the entire family. By including whole families instead of just the at-risk youth, FAST families learn to listen to one another, rely on one another, and respond to problems as a family, rather than relying on the system to fix things. 
Ten years ago, after being created in my home state of Wisconsin, FAST is now being used in 484 schools in 34 states and five countries. This is how FAST works. A FAST team, which consists of a FAST parent graduate and a school-based professional, visits the home of young people deemed at risk by schools. The FAST team invites the entire family to join the next series of FAST meetings. The program runs for eight to 10 weeks and involve approximately 10 to 15 families at a time. During weekly meetings, the varied programming encourages parents to network with other parents, children to relate to their peers, and families to strengthen communication within their own family. Groups of parents meet weekly to support each other in their attempts to help children be successful in school and at home and learn how things such as substance abuse and addiction impact their whole family, not just the substance abuser. In fact, a large part of the FAST program's success is that parents become the primary prevention agent for their children. When families graduate from the FAST program, the large majority want to stay involved. These graduate families join an ongoing school-based group of 40 to 50 families who meet once a month for two years to help each other and to invite at-risk families to complete the FAST program. Therefore, the FAST program becomes a foundation of prevention that is family and community-based. The FAST program has won numerous awards from both government and the private sector. It was one of the four effective programs highlighted at the White House Conference on School Safety last October. It has been funded by a variety of private foundations, state and local governments. In 1998, the Communities in Schools program of the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention funded the dissemination of information about FAST. However, FAST has never been authorized. My amendment authorizes the Attorney General to make available $15 million to implement the FAST program through block grants for fiscal years 2000, 2001, and 2002. This program works at preventing violence, delinquency, and substance abuse, not only for youth, but for the entire family. And then in turn, entire families work to help other families in their communities. I believe it's an excellent program whose time has arrived, and I urge you to make the corrected amendment in order. I'd be happy to respond to any questions about the FAST program. Thank you very much, Ms. Wolf. We appreciate your uh, testimony. Mr. Smart, Mr. Smart, Mr. Smart, Mr. Smart, Mr. Smart, did you present this proposal before? Well, I had intended to. We have drafted an amendment which is remarkably germane to the underlying bill, and yet there was not an opportunity. Um, obviously, uh, the underlying bill did not make it to a full committee markup. Oh, so you're not on the subcommittee? I am not on the subcommittee, on a different subcommittee. So we're ready to present it. Have, oh, absolutely. Absolutely, and especially since the Senate has, um, the other body has taken up this um, particular amendment, um, it was one that I thought was very appropriate given the subject Did you matter. This program started in your area? Started actually in my home community uh, over 10 years ago when I served on the Dane County Board of Supervisors, and I have been so proud to see it grow and become so effective across this nation in really being a community based and family and schools involved. Uh, uh, program to prevent uh, youth violence. Thank you uh, very much, and I suppose it's appropriate to say for the record that your amendment also wasn't included in the amendment that was offered on May 26th by Mr. Moakley to the Legislative Branch Appropriations uh, Bill that we considered on the floor uh, either, and I guess there hadn't been a hearing, and uh, Chairman, it wouldn't have been included. Did, was, did you have this amendment in hand by May 26th? No, I did not. That's yeah. why it was not Yeah, well, I mean, I'm sure it was a great idea, right? Well, we move very quickly around here, as you know. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Baldwin. We appreciate your being here.
And uh, with that, the committee will stand in recess until 6 p.m., at which time we will consider the Air 21 bill. When we complete uh, that hearing and move ahead uh, with that bill, we will come back and hear from members who are not on the Judiciary Committee. Thank you all very much. Federal Reserve Chairman Alan Greenspan and the heads of various technology companies on the impact of their industry on the economy. Live at 9.30, Microsoft Chairman Bill Gates